Lisa Morzell. Okay, welcome everybody. We're gonna uh, get started with our Boulder City Council study session of October 9th, 2018. We are pleased to have special guests with us. Uh, we have two topics tonight. Uh, the first one being CU South. Jane has anything? I don't have much other than to introduce Phil Kleiser from our Comprehen Comprehensive Planning Division of our Planning Department. And Phil's gonna kick us off with this presentation. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, I am joined uh, behind me with several staff members from Public Works Utilities, as well as Open Space Mountain Parks, um, and Director of Planning and, and, and Sustainability, Jim Robertson. To my right, um, we have um, some guests with us this evening from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, L.V. Henson is directly to my right, uh, legal counsel for the university, uh, followed by Francis Draper, um, and please correct me, Chancellor of Strategic Relations. Vice Chancellor. Vice Chancellor <laughs> for Strategic Relations, and um, Derek Silva, Director of Real Estate. And, and so, as proposed at CAC, we would um, like to recommend that we begin with kind of a brief background um, um, kind of tee up this, um, presentation from staff, followed by an opportunity for the university to address council, and then we would kind of get in, getting into the topics for tonight's discussion. The overall intent of tonight's discussion is really to facilitate a conversation among city council members, as well as university officials around potential next steps um, for annexation of the university's south campus, known as CU South. Um, up to this point, really, the conversation has really been centered on um, drilling down into a engineer, an engineering concept for the flood mitigation structure. Um, and so this discussion really comes on the heels of council's decision on August 21st and then confirmed on August 20th to select a flood mitigation concept for the South Boulder Creek uh, to move forward into that preliminary design phase um, for an engineering concept that anticipates using a portion of the CU South land. And so again, tonight is really to gauge council's um, expectations on some of the topics that should be addressed in the annexation application in the future, um, those topics that may need some further discussion or analysis, um, as well as an anticipated review process. And so again, you know, this will just be a brief introduction followed by CU, and then we'll get into the kind of the meat and potatoes of the discussion. Um, the questions for council, as were posed in the memo, really center around the topics as well as the review process. Um, and now just a little bit about the background on the site. Um, I think um, everyone's aware that the university purchased the site in 1996. Um, the city does not own um, acreage on the site, but we do own open space, own and manage open space directly adjacent to CU South. Um, and while there's currently no protected open space on CU South um, as it exists today, the university has allowed for some informal public use uh, for runners, dog walkers, um, and when conditions exist, possibly soon, um, cross-country skiers. Um, and so a little bit of background, and, you've, and some of you have heard some of this before, but just to make sure um, council and everyone um, watching in the audience and, and at home is aware, the university does have some short, has communicated their um, near range and long range plans for the site, near range being up to the next five years. And those include um, partnering with the city on, on implementing the flood project, um, within some of that detention area within the flood project, um, um, seeking um, to create some low impact recreational and athletic fields um, in the flood detention area um, that could also serve as a shared community use. Um, they'll also be within that five year period conducting some maintenance and improvements on the trails. Um, and so you'll, if you were out there, and this, this aerial um, image um, on the slide also shows some of those informal trails that um, traverse the site and, and kind of go around the perimeter as well. You'll see the tennis courts and the maintenance buildings highlighted there. Um, and then finally, uh, the university is interested in making some um, near-term um, investments in the recreational facilities, um, restrooms, uh, enhancing the locker rooms of the tennis facilities, et cetera. In the longer term, though, um, the university is interested in developing a portion of CU South um, for the, in the style of apartments and townhomes for CU Boulder um, faculty, staff, graduate students, and non-first year students, as well as some small-scale academic inst instructional and research facilities that could serve the university and, the, and, and perhaps the community at large as well. Um, the site's currently under the jurisdiction of Boulder County, um, and as, as we do, we partner pretty closely with our colleagues at the county, whether that be the commissioners, um, planning commission, and our, and our colleagues as staff 
um, and we would anticipate um, continuing that tradition moving forward with this process, um, even though the staff, um, um, unfortunately, were not able to make this particular meeting um, tonight. Um, the CAC did ask for a, a one slide on annexations in general, and so just a, a few notes on annexations, um, and that would be, as you know, it's a legislative process, and land can be considered for annexation if it complies with the Colorado um, um, annexation statutes and is consistent with the policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And so there's generally three ways to initiate an annexation process. One would be the landowner petition, and so in this case, that's what we would likely be anticipating as to use the property owner for the site. Um, the second would be a land, an annexation election, which we haven't seen in quite a while in Boulder, up until recently with the potential election of um, the Knollwood subdivision on the western part of the city. Um, and then third is the unilateral annexation of enclaves and municipal owned land. Um, once an application is submitted, um, we do look at things like eligibility requirements, and so at a state level, most commonly referred to as the contiguity requirement of um, one-sixth of the perimeter being um, along the city boundary, but more frequently we hear about our local framework for annexations. And so in Boulder, we have a long tradition of um, established of, of an established um, serviced area concept for how we grow in the Boulder Valley, and that's done through the comprehensive plan. And so the map to the right shows the city of Boulder as area one, and those are areas that currently have urban de um, level development, um, area two being Air, um, sites that are close to the city and are eligible for annexation, and when we do our master plans for the city, our utility plans, et cetera, we plan to serve those areas at some point in the future with urban services. CU South is designated as Area 2, meaning it's eligible for annexation. And lastly, Area 3, um, which we work with our colleagues in the county, in the county to preserve as, um, rural, as a rural landscape and open space type uses. Um, and, a la and, and lastly, um, you know, annexation agreements are typically um, less complicated than the ones we're talking about tonight, and they're typically done at a staff level where we're able to use our existing policies as a framework for establishing that and suggesting and recommending initial zoning. Um, and then ultimately that's brought to the planning board who recommends the city council um, approval, denial, or, or approval with conditions with city council making the ultimate decision on those applications. Um, I have a quick question. Um, could you go over the required community benefits as a result of annexation? So the, the comprehensive plan does have a policy, and I'm pulling it up right now, policy 1.16, and I actually have a copy of that if council would be interested in seeing that this evening, that does talk about community benefits, though it's a bit broader um, and less specific, um, especially considering the recent conversations around community benefits with height and, and density and so on. Um, but generally speaking, um, we annex properties with a lot of development potential only if they can bring significant community benefits to the city of Boulder. And so with community benefits, oftentimes an overriding factor is affordable housing and sometimes it's other things like trail dedication and open space dedication and, and so on. Um, but that's something that is always looked at with annexations, even um, relatively minor and, and small annexations. But, and we can pass these out in just a moment if you'd like. Um, this is just a note um, that, you know, since the earlier days of planning, you know, the city and the county in this area has um, historically included some sort of mix of, of residential and open space on the CU South site. You know, back in the, in the 70s, it went from a, a largely um, um, low density residential and then refined in 77 um, to be largely open space and mountain open space and parks. Um, with some medium density residential on, northern, on the northern part of the site and low density residential as kind of an extension of that single family neighborhood to the southwest. And that's sort of how it remained on the right up until last year. Um, and so in 1996, after the university purchased the site, there were several requests to the city to look at these land use designations and think about changing them to public to match the university's intent for the site, as well as consider annexation. And so really since the 90s, um, we, um, during those requests, um, deferred those conversations until we had a plan in place for the South Boulder Creek flooding issues. So in 2015, 
um, when that plan was accepted, that prompted staff to initiate the process through the comp plan of looking at the land use designations and ultimately the guiding principles. And so that's what sort of um, initiated that process back in 2015 and in 2016. And so really dating back to the 90s, flood mitigation, going forward, flood mitigation has really been a central theme in protecting life and property through that process. Um, you might also recall that through the comp plan, there was some hesitation around changing the land use designations without a better idea of what might happen on the site. Um, and for that reason, the city and county partnered to create the guiding principles that were established in the comp plan. To, and it took a map-based approach in trying to identify what happens in specific areas of the site. And so that's how we've been, um, we've been looking at these sorts of, uh, this presentation and the materials through the lens of those guiding principles. And my last, my final slide in the background section of this um, presentation before handing it over to see you, um, would be just a, a note on a high level timeline moving forward. Um, and so the, the box to the left is really just to illustrate that we're able to build this process off a, um, a library of, of information that we have now, um, including the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Master Plan, the guiding principles and the concept evaluation um, approved by council um, um, last, or selected by council last month. The high level timeline just shows on the top some of the key milestones for the flood mitigation process and on the bottom, the annexation process. And so what I'd like to highlight here is that in that blue section, over the next year, we anticipate the preliminary design, including those conversations and approvals through the regulatory bodies, um, as well as starting to reach those landowner agreements, taking about a year. What we're proposing, and we'll get in more into this in more detail later, is within that year time frame would be when we would have the discussions around the annexation process um, through that process and ultimately come to terms on an annex with an annexation agreement. And ultimately those things would come together um, through public hearings um, in about a year. If annexed, um, we would anticipate the final design for the flood mitigation project taking a year with a two year construction period following that. Um, and then around the 2021, and I believe CU is gonna get into more detail with this, um, they would be completing their campus master plan around that 2021 timeframe. And so as staff, we've begun looking at a potential agreement down the road as an opportunity to provide um, some criteria and at times bookend some things um, and have certain constraints on the site and opportunities for the site that CU can use and work within in their future master planning for the site, if that, if that makes sense. And so with that, I'd love to hand it over to um, our, our colleagues at the university. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Phil. So uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you very much for inviting us to join you in this study session tonight. We really appreciate, and I think we can say we represent the university, the chancellor and the regents, and that we appreciate the partnership from the city and being willing to continue to discuss this in a way that will meet the fiduciary requirements for both of our organizations. So that's really huge and I think we're a good demonstration for many other communities actually. Um, in recognition of the urgency of your deliberations around selection of a flood mitigation project, um, we did work very quickly to get through our process. Um, we're not exactly the speediest crowd over there at CU. Um, but we did try to work through this so that we could um, provide you with some answers about what our, some of our requirements might be and also really provide you a list of what the benefits are we're bringing to the community. So that was uh, something that we ran through a variety of departments, our chancellor's office, the president's office, and ultimately our region so that we could provide you something that you could actually rely upon. So um, I wanna make clear that the university does view that it is the business of the city council to select the flood mitigation project that you feel is most appropriate um, for the community and we wanna work to partner with you on that and we tried to frame these things in such a way that you can just calculate it into the decision you make but it wouldn't necessarily bar you from making one decision versus another. <laughs> we need to we would not have gone to this process just yet, as you know, if uh, because we do, um, we are starting the long process of our campus master plan, and we would not have brought forward an annexation 
petition probably until after that was complete and we had more definitive plans about the site. Um, but we're happy to bring these forward because of the urgency of the situation of really getting something moving here. Um, I just want to mention that the campus master planning process is a multi-year process. Um, we've just hired a consultant to help us. And one of the things that we do is we meet with all of the colleges, the schools, the institutes, the labs, the um, operational units to find out what they see in the future. And as Cindy can tell you, she's been through this process. It's very laborious, but we really need to ask them all to see how they think education might be changing over the long term and therefore what their needs might be. Um, so what are we going to need in the way of housing and classrooms and technology and meeting spaces and um, operational spaces and how is technology going to change all of that? So it's really a big process. Um, and we want to engage the city and the community in that process, which we did in 2011. And I think that process itself offers an opportunity for us to sit down and talk about what would be um, an acceptable process uh, from the city's point of view to get that engagement and input from the community and the city as to what we should be thinking about as we develop that. So that's one key thing. Once that's done in 2021, figure towards the end of 2021, uh, we need to get approval from our design review board, uh, the Colorado Commission on Higher Education, the Office of the State Architect, and our Board of Regents. And at that time, then we can begin to bring forward the actual designs and plans for actual buildings, um, which would require also an approval by the Design Review Board and the Regents and the Governor's Office and the State Legislature. So while we're not able to provide a site plan or what those buildings are today, um, we want to provide you clarity on our requirements for the annexation and how what we expect to do, and then offer that process for your input when we do get to that stage that mirrors what we've already agreed to for the um, conference center. So we realized, hey, we've already done this. We've come to terms on this and we're giving fairly detailed plans at that time to get city comment. And so literally we took that provision that we've all agreed to and just changed the name <coughs> from conference center to the South Boulder campus um, and we think that provides us a good entryway to ensure that down the road there is input from the city on those buildings as we plan them. So we see ourselves as a partner in this process in achieving the construction of the flood mitigation project, which we agree we have an ardent interest in getting that done and making sure that the um, safety of the community comes first. And we strongly believe there's a lot of common ground here and that we can meet the goals of, uh, I think, the city and the university as two separate governmental entities. We've done it before, and I think we can do it again. So thank you. Thanks, Francis. Yeah, I'm sure we'll have questions. Sure. Um, Lisa? So Francis, thank you so much for that and <clears throat> for everybody being here tonight. I, when I read your letter and uh, or, and um, went through all of the different boards and the legislature and the re how I was just wondered is are those all being done in parallel with each other or are they sequential? How what's the time frame we're talking about? So generally, they are sequential. So um, they don't operate in parallel, so we would want to go to our own design review board first, for instance, if they really take um, exception to the way we've designed something and don't feel it's consistent with the university's image, they'll let us know. And um, so we need to go through that process, certainly our regents through subcommittee and regular, and then through the state to make sure that we get pr um, approval at the various boards and legislature. And is the state architect the same as CU's architect, or are they very different? And, They're different. And where, what role does the state architect play in terms of saying yes or no to CU? You know, I don't know the details, and Derek might have more information, but what they do is provide guidance and input if they see that there's something that they think is materially um, in question. And if, for instance, might be if the state architect is aware that the legislature is concerned about buildings on campuses in general that have some aspect to them, he may raise that or she may raise that. 
but um, or if there is some major issue they see with the design that they would recommend against or that kind of thing, but we it's a hoop we have to pass through. So does the state, was the state architect involved in CU's uh, law building? B back originally would have been in that planning process. Oh, okay. Thank you. Just two. I'm sorry, just a clarification. Involved in the master planning process part of it, but not in the actual building um, design process? So the state architect is, yes, in the master planning process. Thank you. And in fact, why don't I hand out, we did a little list of how this works because it's hard to keep in your head. And we thought, you know, it might be helpful. So I'll, I'll just hand those around um, to make sure everybody has that to refer to. Thank you. I, I didn't think there was anything that would make our city processes look quick and simple, but I, what you've just described. I think you're, you're, you're <laughs> yeah, got quicker processes than we do. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Francis, thank, thanks for that, for that statement, and um, appreciate the university as a, as a good partner in this process. I just had a, a curiosity question. What, uh, how often is the master planning process done? When was the last one completed? Every 10, in 10 years, so in 2011 was the last okay, completed Okay, that's when one. you finished the last one. Wait, so it takes three years to do something every 10 years? Is that what? Correct. Wow. Okay. Well, our, it sounds like our, our, our comp plan. Our, yeah, comp yeah. plan. Yeah. Okay. We're doing great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. Um, Some have taken longer. <laughs> so I guess in terms of process, um, you all sent us a very meaty letter, and staff was, why don't you explain how, what comes next so we can. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this was a, you know, it, it was, it's a, it, there's a lot of topics here and there's opportunities to go in, a, I think, a lot of different directions with this discussion. Um, what we have done, um, given the timing of the memo for this meeting, the memo actually went out before we received the, the letter, and so it talks about the anticipated letter. Um, and so since receiving it on Monday, what we've done as staff is to do kind of a first take at a pretty high level of looking at the bullets included in CU's letter, and then put that side by side um, and do a quick analysis around um, the guiding principles, um, council's de um, decision and direction on the flood mitigation and the open space board of trustees recommendation and start to flush out whether or not there's points of alignment and there's points where they may not be aligned as well. And so how we've structured these topics that you see on the screen here, and we have a slide for each of them, um, is, you know, um, and I'll come back to this in just a second, but they're basically yellow, um, red, um, I'm sorry, uh, green, yellow, or red. And so green being, we, we think at a high level, we have some pretty, uh, we have some alignment given our existing policies. Not aligned are things that we kind of want to bring to your attention. We may need to come back to you in the near future. Um, and then kind of a different shade of yellow being, what do we need clarification? Um, was something just not mentioned in CU's letter, but it's in our guiding principles, and we just have to kind of close the loop on that. And then things that need a bit more analysis and discussion. And so we have that structure set up that we've made over the last few days um, after receiving that letter that we can kind of tee up these different topics for. And per CAC's direction, the goal tonight would be to really more about process and less about the content and whether or not we want um, council takes a particular position on one of these issues. Um, but in looking at the different topics, um, the things that we ha um, are suggesting that we, we try to get through tonight would be on the left, and that would be the level of application detail. So that's been something that's been discussed about having a site plan or not. Um, um, the review process um, that um, CU has proposed, um, flood mitigation, levy removal, and open space. But again, we can, you know, we can probably move some of those topics to the left-hand side if those are things that council would want to do. And so that's how we as staff um, have, have thus far suggested, you know, to structure the conversation. But, but I'm curious, you said you have a slide on each one of those bulleted points? But we would only suggest right now um, you going over those ones on the left, but as a backup slide, we, we can talk about any of them, basically. Well, I, I guess, I don't know what you people know. think. To me, there are some th certain things that were listed right at the beginning, like 129 acres mm -hmm. and 30 acres here, and just kind of a, hey, are we in, 
to look at a map and go, okay, how many acres are here and how many are there, just to get a sense of, of that as a starting point would be useful to me. Uh, I don't know about you guys, just to s see how close we are on some of those basics. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have a slide on that? Of just showing the, what's the well, existing conditions? Well, the basic numbers, yeah. we're talking I mean, they, about they 80 don't. acres of the city for, for flood mitigation, 129 acres for the um, development at CU South. And, and There's a discussion of 50% of the land, 50% of the land is 154 acres. So I, I just have some basic questions about the numbers that we're talking about because in that letter it becomes pretty firm about the, mm -hmm. the numbers when in fact my understanding was these were kind of estimates, engineer estimates of how we move things around. So, so I'd like some discussion on that. Is that an okay, okay place to start? Yes, I, I have the same questions. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, you gave us some magic numbers. How do they compare to reality, or the, on the Well, the numbers ground. that you, the, the diagrams you see here, the, the figures, um, this is just the, the variant that was, that was presented at the meeting um, last month. And so on the right, you see that overlaid, the flood mitigation area overlaid with the land uses. And so what was approved through the comprehensive plan process was 129 acres of land um, being public. Um, 119 acres of land as open space other, um, and then the remaining, I believe it's 65 acres of land um, as parks, urban other. Um, wait, wait, can you just say all those? We got, we got to write this down, so say that again. Yeah. Start over. <laughs> it's, it, we can, we, we calculate it pretty exactly because of our mapping. It's, 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 it's fairly easy, and I can give a little bit of context of why so those lines are there. Repeat, numbers again? repeat those numbers, the please. Sure. So we can write them down, because I can't find that figure. Okay, yeah, the, so the public designation um, on CU South is 129 acres. I know, just And that's just write the it down. number referenced in the CU right. letter. Mm -hmm. um, the parks, urban, other, which is the large portion, is really the, the flood mitigation structure, is 65 acres. And then open space other, the remainder of that being 119 acres. Um, and so how we got those shapes during the comp plan was the open space other generally aligns with the, what's, called the, what, what's called area protected by the levy that's on the site right now. Some people refer to that as um, if the levy wasn't there, it would be the 500 year floodplain. And then the parks urban other was based on that option D that came out of the 2015 study. And so that's how those lines were drawn during the comprehensive plan process. Where'd the last five acres go? Yeah, I mean, I added up 313 and they started with 308. There's some right of way that's along that northern part, the CDOT right-of-way that's often netted out, and I, that's the, typically the difference between the 108 to 115. Where's yeah. the, the 108? The 308. 308. 308. 308. Yeah. Um, to just to the, to the north of that flood um, structure, where the you see the, oh. the road structure coming into the site some. Yeah. So, okay, so then let's talk through what so you said in our letter. Oh, yep. In terms of acres. So Phil, um, the parks are another, you said that that was based on the option D? Yes ma'am. Has staff looked at the difference between um, parks are, for, for parks are another given that we did not go with option D and how does that compare with the option that we did go with? So in, in looking at what was selected by council last month, it generally does f follow those lines pretty pretty closely, and I think the, this is, you know, not the final boundary of that, um, but it does not include that area to the north of the Vili Channel up in the north, and so that's probably the biggest difference. That, and this is a, a topic for just for, to notify council tonight, again, and circle back around, is the area of excavation and the open space other is also a change. If that, and, and that's a topic we we're gonna bring up tonight. Right, and given that the design isn't final, we've just 
gone into um, the preliminary design. I guess I, I, well, this is more of a comment. Yeah, well, I guess, so Phil, you, my understanding was staff was gonna look at, okay, here's what's in the letter, here's staff's response analysis to it. Did you do that for the acreages? For the acreages. What, what we're talking about, did you go say, yep, we can do what they've asked for, or not, we can't, except for it will take this moving, or? Oh, we did, um, yes. And so for a portion of that um, relating to the flood mitigation, and this could be the first thing that I could perhaps bring up to council, um, is, is this the area that, this was the area that was discussed at length during um, the recent hearing with, or the recent agenda item with council. Um, and this is one of those areas where we, we don't feel that there's necessarily alignment with right now. And this relates to what I think was called Little Italy during the yep, meeting. I called from it that. Council Member Morzell. And I, I don't know if this is the point that you were, you were speaking of or not with the acreages. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, you know, our, our team has done the analysis and has done as much um, excavation as possible in that parks, urban, other area. Um, and there's still six acres left of land that needs to be excavated. That land, council's direction was to um, don't, don't impact the tennis courts and don't impact open space other. In order to get that six acres though, we'd have to go on to either the public or the open space other. And so this is one of those items because in the letter from the university, um, it does, one of the requirements is retaining that 100, that, that public acreage of 129 acres. And so this is one of the friction points as an example, and I think this is the acreage point that you might be talking about, um, is we're gonna probably have to come back and have, be, have guidance from council and see you around what to do with this remaining six acres. May I just add a little clarification to that? Yes, please. Um, it, it was not that the public 129 needed to be retained. It was that 129 acres of developable land needed to be offered wherever y you end up wanting to put it. So if you decided you wanted to use the entire public area but turn the OSO area into the area we could develop, we can discuss that. We're just saying 129 acres doesn't have to be within those perfect lines. And so, okay, wait, 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 hang on. We have a whole lot of I people. I would respond to Francis, do you mind? Sorry. I, well, I have a question too, Maybe. so go ahead. Francis, does the, so the, you know, the, the newest flood mitigation plan, there's that um, sort of northeastern section that's designated parks, urban, other, that little tab over there, would that be an area that the university would consider available for development? Where is that area? It's the, the yeah. little green tab to the yeah, okay. northeast. The, the teapot spout. Yeah. That currently has a pond in it that mm -hmm. I think has been there for quite a while and we can discuss what a wetland is or isn't, but I'm guessing that's one that probably qualifies. Right, so there probably isn't any developable land in that section, right? So that you gotta count that out in other words, right? Yeah. Okay, Lisa. And then I had a question, Francis, in, in the first point, it says use up to 80 acres of CU pro Boulder properties to provide land in the most optimal location for the city's critical flood mitigation. How does that 80 acres work with the 129, the 119, mm -hmm. the 65? I can, I can answer that. So when we were originally speaking about this, uh, you, were, you had approved option D and that was what was on the table. And option D, we were estimating at the time, required about, give or take, 80 acres. So we decided 80 acres was roughly what we would contribute. We went to everybody and said, let's offer to do that. And so now um, another one is on the table that might require less acreage. But what we're saying is, again, you pick the site and where you think is most appropriate. We've got up to 80 acres for you to use for that purpose um, that we've pledged to the project. Mm -hmm. So again, you could completely, re we've seen other configurations where it takes over the whole LSO area. Maybe that's the 80 acres, but again, you tell us. We figured that out through our engineering. And, and s you may have already said this, Phil, but the variant that we chose uses up roughly how many acres? Do we know? Sounds like 71. We're not sure the exact acreage offhand, but I believe it's 
probably over 50 acres. Yeah. Oh, but under 80. Yeah, it's it's well under 80 because it's less than the parks urban other by a moderate amount. So okay. the consultants will have those numbers around the November December so, time frame. Uh, okay, so it may be we don't have to discuss this because that's not a ceiling we bump again. But if we were going to choose whatever flood mitigation we want. Maybe this is a semantical point. Don't we need whatever acreage it takes for the flood mitigation we need? So is that a question? <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to think, but it may be a moot point because it sounds like right. we'll it, be able it to may do it be a less. moot point. But what we've said is based on what we had known previously and in order to stop washing around the tub, so to speak, in terms of we were asked, what is the university looking for? We were trying to be definitive and saying, we've got 80 acres for you and you can use those for flood mitigation. Now, if you know, I've seen some other scenarios put forward where it was the whole parks area and the OSO. At that point, we'd come to you and say, we're gonna give you the 80 acres to use, as we said. Um, we're gonna have to talk about purchase price on the other. Okay, but is it fair to say that as we go forward in designing the flood mitigation, that whatever acreage we need to build what we think is necessary is negotiable but it may cost, or it may need to be make up somewhere else. But just so as you know, a you have 80 to deal with, and then if you went to 120, let's say, uh, then you'd have to look at. We said um, come up with a valuation of land mediated by a third party to come up with a value for that additional purchase. But as a principle, we could deal with that. We could talk about okay. it. Okay. Yeah. I think who, who's got a deal? So all those things that Zan said, but the firm line is that 129 acres of a developable land remain no matter what. And um, is is this portion um, of OSO up there because of the existing levy? Is why? Because that's an interesting curvature to that line. Um, I'm just wondering if we can make up some of those six acres up there. Like, wh what's why does that go in that direction? It was generally, it, that's the general location of that area on the FEMA map that's protected by the levy. And so I can show you um, one example. This is the, the FEMA map here. You see how it kind of jogs up that gray area in the middle, kind of jogs up and cuts the site. That's generally the location um, used um, um, for that OSO. And so we would anticipate um, in the future to that, that would likely, if the levy was removed, would likely be converted to a, like a, a fly under your uh, floodplain. So there's, there might be some, some issues with critical facilities that the university may or may not be able to use that area in the, uh, possibly. Okay, so we got the 129, we've clarified the 80. Um, 129 is their request, or maybe more than a request, whatever you call that. Um, there was also, two other figures used. One is that 50% of, is it 50% of the 129 can have buildings on it? No, well, 50% of 308. I think I think oh. what you're referring to is right, the right, statement right. Okay. where we said, CU Boulder has agreed that developable, development of habitable and academic structures will occupy less than 50% of the university's entire property. That's that 129. Okay. Okay, so that's, Okay. Yeah. And the so, same. so, so that's I sort of just got very confused about that because we all know what the given right. property is. And well, I think the reason we raised it is because we're often asked, "What do we need?" And of course, we have a 308-acre property, and the question is, "What does the city need?" Mm -hmm. um, but in these negotiations and going through the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan process, where there was a lot of public input and input by the various boards and bodies. Um, there was a lot of interest in maintaining some land for open space, um, at flood retention, playing fields, and so we've agreed that we will develop less than 50% of our total property. It's, it's just more of an overall statement. Okay. Okay. Sorry, there's it also was confusing. It was just confusing. But now I think we numbers. got it. Um, there's also a 30 acre figure around athletic fields. I guess that's all easily, go ahead. And that's something that we want to bring up today too. Yeah. Okay, so so far, I'm just gonna, you guys interrupt if you have questions. So, so far we know that we have six acres to talk about in terms of excavation. And so are we just identifying these things? That's, that's the point of tonight is to go, yep, we gotta, those things don't align, we gotta discuss. Exactly. Okay, everybody agree with so, that? 
must be discussed. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, we did, you know, we are attempting at a high level to, to find those areas of alignment and areas that we needed to, to do a little bit more work in. Um, and one of the things that we've heard, you know, come up during the comp plan process as well as recently is around the level of detail. And so um, this, this particular topic um, um, is, you know, typically in an annexation while, um, one moment, there is no, so there's no requirement for a site review in an annexation application, um, but most larger scale applications do, do provide some sort of site plan. Um, and the, sometimes those are, are preceded by a concept plan review as well through the, plan, through, through the city's process. Um, and so in their letter, the university outlined an, a requirement which is on the screen that the city would not require a site, man, a site plan submission um, with annexation. And so if council were to move forward with that, um, in, in um, uh, agreeing with that requirement, um, this particular annexation would be less of a site plan based review um, and more of a performance-based application. And so instead of having a site plan like you see on the screen here, which was the recent um, annexation of um, the old Silver Saddle site, um, what we would see is an agreement that would be memorialized and include um, things around density and intensity, a transportation program, a utilities program, but it wouldn't look like you would typically see it. And so this is one of those areas where we don't know if there's agreement or not, so we've identified it as something that needs to be addressed. So, so yes. So, but, but hang on one second. So, do you want us to go? Yep, this needs discussed, or are we supposed to discuss it now? I'm I'm a little baffled by this process. Do you mean stat? If we say uh, this is a point of contention, then what? Yep. And if you have any guidance for us moving ah, forward, because okay. this will um, inform the next steps of their pro of the their process of, of what they are gonna propose to the city. Okay, I do have one question on them for CU, and then Lisa. Oh, you go, you go first. So, so we have this 129 acres, and, and you don't want a site plan, and I get that. You know, it's a lot of detail. Um, it's not that we don't want one, we don't have one. You don't have <laughs> one, right. And you don't even have a concept plan at this point. Right. But I guess I am, um, somewhat curious in terms of the density on that 129 acres, um, you know, the permeability, all of that stuff. It's not like I'm complaining about your campus now because it's a beautiful campus, but I'm just curious in terms of, you know, what would we, would all 129 acres be 100% covered? I doubt it. You know, and so what? It's not our what style. Do you, what do you see in terms of coverage? And so I would urge everyone to try to let go of what do you see? How dense is it? How are the buildings ra arranged? We've already agreed to a number of things that were limited: height, uh, village style, gradual increase in in the height, those kinds of things. What we really should talk about is the process you would like to see to have input to our campus master plan as we go through that, and then knowing we will come back to you with the process we've already agreed to for the conference center, we'll do the same thing on these buildings. Mm -hmm. So as they get planned, you have an opportunity to review them, give us input, um, feed it all back. If you want to have public sessions, have public sessions. but. Constantly going back to say, what's it going to look like? Um, we're only going to have to tell you we don't know. Well, and it, uh, you know, we know it's frustrating for everybody. It's just we simply don't know at this point. Yeah, and we envision this to be a two-phased approach. So there's the input that would be with the master plan, which would include a master plan for the South Campus. And then additionally, for each facility that's developed, you would have that uh, hotel conference center model for review. So I guess my question is, but what about something in between? A bubble diagram, a, a that gets <clears throat> towards a concept review, or you know, like something that lays out likely-ish, even if it's in vague terms, when you add up all those things you said you would do, what does it leave us with? I, I meant just, because it's really hard for the public and us, knowing that this is the time with greatest leverage, 
to, to just say, you know, trust us in a few years with a different regents, with a different council, well, it'll be figured out then, is doesn't feel very reassuring. So I, anyhow, what about something a so little bit I in between? So I think that um, what we've heard from our regents and others is we've gone pretty much to the brink of allowing another governmental entity to tell us how to build by restricting what we're doing, by offering that input process. And so getting that to go further than it has, which was still another pace forward with the conference center, um, is gonna be a very tough road to hoe. Aaron? So a thought on that is, so I, I appreciate the commitments that you all have already made. And so I think the important thing will be writing an annexation agreement that includes those in some kind of followable, bindable kind of way, right? So like um, the village style, for example, well, it, you, it probably needs to be quantified a little bit. You know, what, is, what does that mean? Um, well, housing might be arranged around courtyards or something. You know, so I, I think there, there would, the direction I would, I would ask of, of staff and of CU would be that as these negotiations are moved through is to think about how these commitments that you're willing to make can be put together into a binding agreement that we can all point to our residents and say, look, you know, they've committed to this and here's how it will work out. And I think we can put some things in about that input process to the master plan, to having the give and take onto the process that we've proposed as a, um, Appendix A in the letter we sent. Uh, the difficulty is we still need to actually survey our faculty and staff again to say, What's your interest and in depending on the product? So my interest in one product may be zero, but in another product might be, oh, I might be interested in that if you could do it at a reasonably close to market rate. And, and so we don't know that we're gonna build it around a courtyard or. So I was using that as an example, yeah. but you, you've said the village style, right? So what does that mean, right? And so that just by itself is probably too indefinite, you know, so. Totally get that you're not sure if it would be stacked flats or townhouses or what, and that's, to me that's fine. But I think that, I think we would probably be looking for some kind of definition written into the agreement that, that we can all kind of point to as we go forward. And I guess Cindy, and then so Lisa and then Jill. <clears throat> I just wanted to remind us, sitting here, that the university was in formation before Colorado became a state by the university, I mean CU Boulder. And um, so it's old. And it, I don't think they're hedging or fudging when they say they don't know. And, it's, and we also don't know what education's gonna look like in future. So it may be more remotely achieved. They may not need as much housing down there, or they may not need as many faculty buildings, although that's difficult to, imagine. Um, but I, to my mind, the things that are really crucial to our community like transportation, how are we going to deal with transportation? What levels of service are we going to maintain going forward on this particular site that we want to work with the university with early on and have a public process about so that people and get something that we feel that we can agree on so that people feel that they have been heard on this. So just in terms of application detail, you think transportation trumps that, is that what you're saying? I do. Okay. I do. But, but uh, Could I just offer one addendum to what I said before, is that I could imagine the annexation agreement having, uh, uh, you know, what if scenarios say, well, if it's going to be housing, it, it would need to be go under these constraints. If it's going to be academic, right? It wouldn't necessarily have to be a commitment that we will do these things, but say, well, if we're going in this direction, it would have these criteria placed on it, so, something like that. Some, so not, not to the level of site plan, not even the level of, of bubbles, but just some things to say, if we go this way, we'll, it'll look roughly like something like this. Well, I have Lisa and then Jill. Well, yeah, I was gonna ask first for, you know, what does it mean a village type style? So I guess that's a, that's a question. I think all that was meant at the time is we're not going to build chunky uh, dormitories. That's really the extent of what it meant. But somewhat compact and interconnected or, 
Right, but but yeah. So now we're going into details that we don't know. Right, <laughs> um, right. And, but mainly and it was just we're not going to build, a, you know, a ten-story building in a chunk with an elevator in it and and house you know hundreds of students there. Right. So I guess one of the questions, you know, that will be very important to me, and I agree with Cindy. We we probably in that first list, Philip, that we'd probably want to bring transportation over to the left side. Um, I guess uses are really important, at least from my perspective, what goes on there. And I know um, it's really premature or early in this process to figure out, is it going to be, what percentage is going to be housing, what percentage is going to be academic uses, what other uses. And um, each one of these have different issues, and I, and I know a lot of people in the community, and I know me for one, you know, would really like to see more housing there and academic uses more on the main campus. But again, you have to do your survey to figure out Whether they'll even what come. you need. And I think there's a lot in flux right now. At how do you teach? And, you know, who's going to be the next, you know, field biologist, or and how do you do that? Okay, we're going to speed up a little bit. All so of that. You so, but know. anyway, I guess I'm one, my question is, would there be a way in this process of us being able to get a better sense of what kind of housing we're talking about and what kind of academic? And maybe maybe it's too premature, pre or too early. I don't know. And I actually was going to come here tonight and say I don't know. I mean, after reading your letter, there's I have a, several points that I want to go into, and I think we'll get into them. But, but I want this to be a constructive discussion. And there's some points in there. I think there's no way the city can do it, and you can't. We can't be held accountable for those. And I don't want to get into a back and forth, back and forth. But I guess I would like to know, you know, how much academic is going to go there and how much housing. And okay. I think so that's something that's gonna really important. Okay. So that's that's a request. I have Jill, Mirabai. We're going to try to wrap up this one, Mary. Yep. I um, just am going to jump on. I agree with Cindy. I think it's premature for us to set anything that you guys should be doing. Everything changes. I think we need to keep in mind that we're the ones who came to you. you this is premature for your planning process. And, you know, I, I know that we like to micromanage development in Boulder, but I think the university has done a lot better job than the city of Boulder has in terms of their development. I think the university is the most beautiful part of our city, far better than what we end up with our land use regulations all throughout town. And so, sorry, Jim, that's not a reflection on you. You're great, but I, give me a university building over, you know, West Pearl any day. And so, um, I, I just think that to, 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 to give them, the lead platinum buildings, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It's in their best interest to create something beautiful and, and useful and, and that, that will last, you know, hundreds of years. So I guess I'll kind of jump on with Aaron a, a little bit, but then also Cindy. I think there, for staff, there needs to be something that we need to bring into guiding you with, or if we go in this direction or if we go in this direction, what are we going to do and maybe have some very rough, open-ended, um, well, not maybe open-ended, but <laughs> some rough rough guidelines because, again, we talk about things where even just um, pl the playing fields and not building large-scale stadiums, but large-scale is what? Because 6,000 is still pretty large to me. So, yeah, it might not be 20,000, but maybe, you know, just some from very gentle guidelines there. But then I would agree with Jill that, uh, yeah, you have the most beautiful buildings, and I wish all of our buildings <laughs> looked like that. So as long as it stayed within that uh, design guidelines, I mean, I'd be thrilled to have that. So. Uh, kind of a combination if we can. Mary? So I would agree with what's been said so far. I just wanted to understand. Um, Two different things have been said. Uh, the so things, which? okay. 
what what Jill said, what um, Lisa said, what um, Cindy said, and what Mirabai said. So, um, and Aaron too. <laughs> Okay, do you guys want, here's the <laughs> what, question. So what I okay with the application detail, that's what we want to know. Well, I just, uh, that's my question, is there are some questions that um, I have that are under the category of CU Boulder annexation baseline requirements. And I just want to make sure that if we move away from this, I ask them, I didn't ask them in the right place, or I want to make sure if I need to ask them now, well, I think, so, Phil, let's talk about this. Well, some people are okay with, hey, they build beautiful buildings, let's go on. Um, I think th there's a bunch of stuff in the principles, and there's, I think, a, if we, we, the, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. There's things that were in those principles that are really important, and some of them need to be further fleshed out when it comes to site detail. So do you want us, we're in this flow, did you want us to talk about that? I, I think at this point, this was a kind. This was such a big kind of go, no go. If, if you're comfortable um, moving forward with knowing that we're not gonna have the traditional site plan, but we will have a more performance-based standards like you're talking about where some of the principles need to be further defined um, and flushed out and more analysis needs to happen in order to, to get to a level of detail that compensates, that gets your comfort level to a point where you, you're you comfortable moving forward in a process because it compensates for the lack of a site plan. That okay, makes. I think, yeah. so I guess we're not weighing in on all those just right now. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, the, I, I guess, so, so let's see if, if everyone agrees. We've been told we're not getting a site application. Can we live with that? Assuming we have, you said performance-based, I think I've also heard the request mm -hmm. for also some more descriptors about some of the principles, mm -hmm. um, and and some of which we may want to talk about further. Yeah, and um, some quantifiable sort of standards. Okay, and maybe those get to some of the specifics we're talking about. Perfect. This, okay, that's the one very thing I, the one thing I will press back a little bit on, just. For, and then we can move on is, we know you guys need housing, and that's not gonna change. And so I guess this whole, well, we don't know what we'll need. Yes, we do. We're gonna need housing. You guys need housing. We all know we need housing. So I think that that is not going away, and that being able for the, the, the university to commit to a substantial amount of housing is not an unreasonable request. So we did do that in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. We agreed to a limit that was placed on us of 1,100 units. Right, it also talks about the, the academic, non-academic right. mix. Well, yeah, right. so I guess to me that's a place where I don't think we're going out on a limb too far to Push for some no, not at all. I, the guiding principles also specify that the predominant use will be housing or residential, and so I, predominant to me means certainly more than half. Um, so I would say that most of the development out there would be housing. And d d that's awesome. Thank you. That's very helpful. When you say more than half, more than half the acreage, more than half of the square f footage, more than what, what would, anyhow, that's the kind of just any more. I think is helpful to us. Go ahead. Yeah, and just uh, thanks for bringing that up in the guiding principles, and and that's what I'm talking about. And kind of let's make sure that we translate the things we've already agreed to on to, into this next step of the process. Okay, good enough for now. Yep. Um, this is something that's uh, probably a, a quicker discussion. Um, and so while the comp plan didn't actually identify a review process of establishing one for the future. Um, it is a topic of interest, um, and as the university mentioned, we've kind of already um, have discussed this in, in, to some extent during this meeting, um, but in gen generally speaking, um, the university's letter proposes um, throughout their process, prior to construction, submitting a number of documents to the city. Um, the city would then have um, an obligation, an opportunity to um, include council planning board and the community in a process and within a set number of days, provide comments back to the university. Um, we view this as needing a little bit more analysis through the process, really to understand councils and the community's preference and comfort level with the approach um, and to determine whether or not we need to refine it at all um, to, to be responsive to council's um, interest in a, in a future process. 
if that it would be. Can I ask two questions on behalf of the whole? Um, one is, we've talked a little bit, and I think it might be useful to remind the public and maybe some of us, the conference center process that's being alluded to, could maybe somebody just sort of remind us of what that is? And then, and then another question for you guys. Well, maybe we'll start there. Okay. And could I just requ um, request as part of that, if you could just um, give us the acreage at the conference center? Oh, gosh, do you know the acreage? It's uh, just over three acres. I think the more importantly, it's in the heart of the city, and it's on your main thoroughfare, and it will be a defining building for the sitting city in terms of um, what we look like as a community. So I think we spent a fair amount of time coming up with this process at the time because of exactly that, to have a little more input and influence and time to provide that input. So... Um, all we did in this process is we currently have this agreement executed between the city and the university that we simply change the names to reflect CU South. So that as we bring forward our plans, it would be um, things such as, <coughs> excuse me, prior to construction of any facilities on CU Boulder South property, the university will submit to the planning director or designee for review and comment sets of each of the following. One, estimated construction timelines. Two, building plans and specifications. Three, site plans. Four, grading plans. Five, water, wastewater, stormwater management and flood control plans. Six, landscape plans. Seven, shadow analyses. Eight, energy and lighting analyses. Nine, emergency vehicle access plans. And 10, site circulation, transportation, and street plans. So it's fairly comprehensive down to, you know, sort of the size of the underwear kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is... And if I might add to that yeah. too, a lot of the design-related um, parts of the conference center plan, it's review and comment. It's not a regulatory document. Um, and then, you know, and, and if, you, if you had a chance to read Exhibit A to the letter that CU sent, they, they took a... They basically took that out of the, um, the conference center... MOU and you know it basically says here's here's how you get to interject into a review process and it more or less defines whose codes they're going to use when they build things so they're not going to use our building code they're going to use the state building code on and on and on on all of their development standards okay so that what you have in the appendix a is taken from the agreement okay just want to make sure. So for anybody that's following this, that's where that is. Okay. Um, so s you, your question to us is, yeah, but the 45 days part. It, essentially, we're, we're identifying this as something that in a future engagement process, in a future discussions, we'll probably need to possibly, I don't know if we'll need to refine it or not, but it's something that might need a, some additional analysis around. Yeah, and, and I would assume that it will need to be refined as we move forward in our talks with the university. Um, you know, this this was designed for a certain kind of urban, pro, you know, very well-defined urban project. Um, of course, this we're moving into something that is greenfield and suburban. Um, it's We're probably going to want to look at it a little bit differently than we did um, the... Uh, um, conference center. Okay. Mary and, and Cindy. And I think just to, you know, consider that the 129 is 32 times bigger than three acres. So I think that that will have a different kind of impact. I, you know, I, I agree that 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 area where the conference and hotel are going to be are pretty impactful, but this is also pretty impactful. And by its sheer size, um, I think it will merit some revisiting and I would just point out that this agreement is for the facilities as they become planned and designed. So you would look at them as they come forward. It wouldn't be a one quick look at the site at a high level. It's looking in fairly detailed specification at each building as it is designed. That's actually, I, I got a cue, but I guess a question then, is the 45 days, because to me, the, there's the concept review sort of discussion, and then there's the site, re I mean, so you, you, it seems to me 45 days, depending on what you're talking about, is pretty fast, depending on how much of that you're trying to cram in. 
So I guess there's the larger site plan and, con you know, what are the words, how it connects and how you get through it and those sorts of things which are different than here's what this building is going to look like. So right. there's a 45 so I, days. Uh, part of that is going to be that master plan input process and then as we um, begin to get more firm on the plans, I think that the planning department would keep advised and I think we can talk about, you know, if we have a whole site plan that's been put together, we can sit down and do that same sort of review with the city and then go to the buildings as they come online. So that's the kind of thing I think we'd want to flesh out. Okay, we got Cindy, Lisa. I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'll pass. I, I was just gonna ask David when he said more refinement in terms of analysis is whether or not these are the kinds of things that Francis has been talking about that you would find to be um, agreeable. Um. I would want to defer a little bit to our technical staff to start with, but second, um, I do think that um, that we can use the um, conference center MOU as a template for going forward, but this is a different project, and I think that um, to assume that we're going to use it exactly as is presented in the, in the conference center MOU is probably not realistic, just given that it's a much different type of development that's gonna be occurring. And there will probably be issues associated with how we engage our community and with, um, you know, with a 45 day review period that, that may w work with a three acre site that is intended to be more of a staff level review. Um, if, there's, if we're anticipating um, more public engagement or perhaps soliciting um, input from, you know, I even if it's in the context of um, comments from, say our planning board or our design advisory board as well, that we would probably want to build an extra time for that type of thing. Lisa, then Aaron. Yeah, I guess my question has, is along those lines in that this site has, it's much larger than the conference site, but it also could entail different boards with different expertise. So we have our planning board, our water resources, our open space, our parks. I don't know if it all would have to go to every single one of these boards. I think it would depend on where we are in, or where CU is in its development. And so I'm just curious in terms of the turnaround time so that those boards, whatever boards those are, have an opportunity to apply their expertise, give us their advice, and then we can, mm -hmm. I don't, I, right. I just don't know how that would work. So this is where I give you a gentle reminder that the university does not view itself to be subject to all of those boards. Right, right. So if that is something that the city in its 45 day period wishes to consult with, absolutely no problem. That would be something you would give us all those feedback along with public comment, but, we are not subject to that process. We're offering to compromise and provide an opportunity to do that, mm -hmm. but not to set cycles where we go to mini boards and we're subject right. to all of those things. No, I understand that. And that's in part my question is to our staff, you know, what does it, what does it take for our boards to look at these different aspects of whatever part of their plan and see you isn't subject to that, I, I recognize that, but you're asking for our, the city council's input. And we have, I don't know, 18, 21 boards that we depend upon for their advice. So I guess the question is, and this is more for city, what would be the turnaround time to get the adequate input we need from our various technical boards so that they could tell us so that we're saying, yeah, we're on board with this, or we, we might want to look at, at this a little more seriously. So that's our staff question. Well, I, so first of all, there's two things. There's uh, matters of regulation, which I would agree with Francis, that um, CU probably has um, some ability to avoid city regulations, um, but there's also matters of contract, which um, is what an annexation is all about. And what we're looking at is a contractual arrangement. And a, as a matter of contract, I think that we can probably make requests that are consistent with whatever we think, whatever the city thinks is in the best interest of the, the city. With that said, even in a review and comment context, uh, 
you know, 45 days is probably something that is more in line with a staff level review, and there's probably not enough time to do get something um, to a board or commission. I think that, you know, if we wanted to have a board and commission to provide comments on something, and I'll ask uh, um, our planning director to correct me if I'm misspeaking, but I, I think you're probably looking more at um, 60 to 90 days to do any that type of a review, just in terms of notice and um, um, memo preparation analysis, and um, you know, and then actually getting it before a board and commission. Great. Um, so, a couple of additional thoughts on that. So, uh, Jim, did you are you going to disagree? Nope. I think David, uh, the the time frames David outlined are correct. Obviously, um, so you know we could work out details. The, the our ability, um, either whether whether we're talking only about internal staff review, whether we're talking about uh, the participation of the public in some form or way, or board and commission review. One of the big variables is how much advance notice do we have when we're going to get the submission from CU because. For example, taking a border commission, we have to get make sure we can get it on their agenda, and they plan their agendas sometimes fairly far ahead. Even our own staff, in terms of resource time, it helps us if we can know in advance we're going to receive the submission on a certain date. Therefore, you need to reserve time, you know, a, a significant portion of your time in the uh, following two weeks or something like that. So um, I do agree with David, his rough time frames and looking more towards 60 to 90 days if you're talking about board and commission review or a significant public review. Um, uh, one of the ways we could streamline that or at least make sure we hit those deadlines would be the advance notice as well. So, so um, yes, yeah, so, so some additional thoughts. I mean, I, I appreciate the willingness to share the level of detail here, um, but I know speaking from my experience on, on planning board that when that's like for us a site review level of detail and you certainly can put conditions on it and change it, but things are really fully baked at that point. And so, you, you, you know, we could offer some technical comments, you'd probably be receptive to some level of it, but if we said, oh gosh, you know, actually um, from a solar shading perspective or something like this, if you shifted them around like this, you'd, and you'd say, well, we've already done all the plans, we can't just shift. So to that point, if we could build in an opportunity for a little bit more open-ended feedback earlier in the process, I think that would be very helpful. Again, non-regulatory, non-binding, totally get that you're not subject to our regulations or required to do what we mention. But if, if maybe you can lay out a couple of tiers of public engagement where it sounds like you're gonna have public interaction around the master planning process. Um, and that's great, maybe we can mention that somehow. But th that when it gets more down to the, the details of this site, but before it's about designing a building to every detail, that there be an opportunity for public and city input at that point. And I think that could be more constructive than this kind of later stage. So I'd, I'd love to see us work through an opportunity. Like, does that seem potentially feasible? Yeah, I think that's something we can certainly discuss. Okay, great. thank well, you. I, I think that I want to see if people agree because I, that's the thing I was trying to get at earlier is this kind of sort of the concept site bigger picture stuff I think matters a lot to people. Um, you do build beautiful buildings and so probably that stage is maybe not as important. Okay. And, and then the last one is that also to consider a heads up that's the there's the time frame that we need to respond to comments in but hey if you give us 30 or 60 day notice oh we're getting close. These, these things are coming, that would be really helpful. So. Yeah, I think we could certainly build that into the process. Great, thank you. Okay, so anything else? We have Cindy, Mary, and then we'll move on to the next one. Well, again, I'm gonna go back, maybe I'm misunderstanding what the performance review is, but I would think it would be around things like, you know, the, the transportation, the issues We're gonna that, get to that transportation. Are, okay, the issues that are, are flashpoints in the community rather than whether or not, and not to use this, Aaron, critically, but the university is very conscious about energy and has become more so with each passing year. So they're- It's a random example. They pay attention to these things. They design these buildings. They're safe, they're this, they're that, et cetera. So what I wouldn't like to see is to get mired down in detail to the point that it halts the process. 
Right, so, so I think we were talking about getting in on the concept review, site layout, that kind of stuff. Mary. I think just enough time to um, maybe not have, go through the board cycle, but I think if we had something like um, um, a, a board, boards that are, um, what's that called, a co-meeting with like say, three different boards or something, and, and there was an opportunity for the public to come provide feedback in something like that, you know, what might the time frame look like? And maybe provide some options as to how that input could look like and how those different scenarios of input provision um, would impact that 45 days, give or take, or probably give or take, I'm not sure, but um, how, how, how much that would have to vary. But yes, I agree with Aaron's points. Okay, we pretty good here? Okay, next one. So we actually see quite a bit of alignment with the, on the topic of flood mitigation. Um, and so just to kind of run through these, um, those two topics we just covered um, are probably some of the more meatier ones. And so um, we can probably get through this one a little faster. There's um, you know, there's general alignment that, you know, yes, we're going to implement the phase one of the flood mitigation study. Um, there's alignment around obtaining the necessary land and easements to build and maintain the flood structure around groundwater monitoring, around the aesthetic design, um, around um, available site access um, to CU South, um, given the location and design of the flood mit uh, mitigation infrastructure, as well as um, future claims and damages that was that was mentioned in CU's letter. Um, where we see some areas of clarification and analysis needed, um, one of those points would be around the location of project wetland um, and habitat <coughs> mitigation. And so the city will have to secure all the necessary environmental permits to mitigate for the project's direct environmental impacts. Um, in CU's letter, um, they did state that the city will be responsible for mitigating the impacts um, to any jurisdictional, jurisdictional wetlands that are damaged or displaced as a result of the flood mitigation, um, including the permits and mitigate the loss of wetlands with a wetland bank credits or land or land the city otherwise owns. And so in this case, when we looked at that particular item, we thought that clarification was needed to determine whether the university would end up agreeing with allowing the city to purchase any of the land designated open space other um, for flood mitigation, um, wetland habitat mitigation purposes. Um, and um, you know, if we have to mitigate, there may not be um, room on, um, for example, if we had to mitigate for the Preble's mouse habitat, um, should there be any need to do that? Um, it'll be difficult to find land outside of the CU South property to do that. Um, and so this issue will, will generally need to be resolved um, probably in the near term in order to keep proceeding down the path of the preliminary engineering. And so that was one thing, clarification that we're gonna have to make and probably in the near term. The, those next two bullets are in regards to the 30 acres um, that the university has requested for recreational uses in the flood um, detention area. Um, and so in the, in the letter, um, you know, the guiding principles are in alignment that will explore that. The letter um, does request at least 30 appropriately graded acres <coughs> available for construction um, that provides sufficient drainage. Um, and so what we need to do is further analysis to determine um, if 30 acres um, will fit into that detention area um, and further discussion will be needed to determine if other locations are needed if it, if it won't fit. And so these are some of the areas that we've identified from their letter and from what we know now as we're gonna have to, to do a little bit more work. Um, and I guess what we would ask is that does council you know, agree with this and other, other flood related items um, that we haven't discussed thus far that you think should rise to the level of future discussions. Can I ask a clearing, clarifying question on the 30 acres? If we, assuming we are able to leave the tennis courts there, does that count towards the 30 acres? So this was our estimate based on our prior conversations about creating um, recreational fields in the detention area, so it might be lacrosse or soccer or whatever it is. That's a no. So no, it did not include the tennis acres, acreage. Okay. So this was a, a best estimate that we had at the time. Since we were hurrying through our process, I think we could spend some time with staff refining that a little more. Ref okay, including the number including of the acres. Number. Okay, that's helpful. Mary? 
this is um, where I had a, that question that I went to bring up, and this is probably most appropriately for Phil. Um, the, um, in one of the requirements, it says that, um, where's my question? Um, the city will ensure that flood detention area used for recreation. No, that's not it. The city will ensure. Yes, that that is the one. Um, engineer to sufficiently drain with a reasonable period of time to ensure that the fields can remain functional after a flood. Doesn't um, Colorado water law pr give you that provision as to what that drainage period should be? That's a question um, I will punt to Jeff Arthur. So yeah, we will have to consider the drain time from a, a major flood to ensure that we don't run into water rights issues. I think the interest was more, can we design these things so that it won't be regularly out of use? Um, that will probably be more challenging now that we're doing more excavation um, than with the earlier concepts. We probably had a little more flexibility to, to stage things and tier things when we were um, working with this smaller volume. So that's those are conversations we'll have to have because it is it's a relatively normal thing to combine athletic fields and detention ponds. But um, as we work through the details of how it's going to work at this location, there will be conversations we'll need to have. Yeah, and so there was the, the following point, I believe, too, was talking about ponding. So um, so those are, I guess, things that need to be discussed. I would. I would just add to that, this is a floodplain. It was mined and we're going to excavate it even more. So uh, that was one of the points that I made uh, some time back about, I think that I'm not an engineer, but I don't know if we can guarantee that. I mean, I, I know you have expectations, but it's a floodplain and it's been mined and so there's, and the groundwater is really shallow. So. It's, I don't know if that's a reason, if that's reasonable, that's about ponding. So I think that those are all reasonable things for staff to discuss further. Um, and I'll note that I believe your letter said in the fields would be available for public use so that in some ways community benefit. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, any more on this one then? Are there other yeah. flood things that we haven't, or I feel like we covered flood pretty thoroughly yeah, the last this, few meetings. The, yep, and this was the one other um, that you all have kind of discussed a little bit earlier in the meeting, and so we don't have to cover that again. Yeah, this one needs to be figured out. Yep. I think we're all agreed. Yep. Um, yep. The other one that we saw, um, some general alignment as well as some other some other things to consider would be the removal of, removal of the levy system. You know, that was discussed a lot in the comp plan. There's a lot of interest in it and there's alignment on both sides that um, it should be that we can um, look at removing the existing CU levy. There's also um, the provision in the letter around future claims and damages that we won't go into, but the city is you know, staff are in alignment with that as well. The clarifications and then the, the non-alignment piece, just to go over, um, impacts to the um, floodplain designations on CU South. And so the CU's letter does um, have a point in there around um, as a, that the floodplains won't increase on the site due to the flood mitigation infrastructure or, or removal of the levee system. And so that was something that will have to, that will be analyzed as we move forward in the process. What we know right now is that the map on the right is the FEMA floodplain map. The lines on that map that show the boundaries of the 100-year floodplain, the area protected by the levee, those are not anticipated to change as we move forward in design of the floodplain mitigation um, structure as well as removal of, removal of the levee though the designations within those areas likely will change. For example, that levee, area protected by the levee, will change to a different designation, likely the 500-year floodplain. Um, the other point, and this is the, the red button, is to determine a use of the levee fill material. So the initial project cost for the flood, for the flood project um, included using that material um, as part of the project. Um, CU in their letter did state that the university would be provided the first option to use or sell that material. Um, and so we need to estimate the project cost um, if we were not able to use that. And that's something that um, we'll have to figure out um, that won't impact the preliminary design schedule 
um, but it will impact cost to an extent. And so that's another thing that we flagged from the letter. Do, but we don't know how much. We, we do not, uh, I don't believe. What kind of costs are we talking about? To buy dirt? So we don't know at, at this point. I think the other consideration would be just public impacts associated with construction. If we're able to move fill on the site, that means we won't be driving trucks right. in and out. So I think it would it would be in our interest to work with the university to try to not be bringing material in and out of the site. So it's just a topic we're going to have to have more so discussion about. So do you about. have a... a Aaron was... A Go ahead, Lisa. I just wanted to know if you have an estimation of the volume that we're talking about. I don't, and again, we're, we're in the process of taking the, the concept that was landed on and bringing that up to just the basic standard of the other options, so I... Well, I would hope we could work, work well together on this material, and it, from all perspectives, it makes more sense to leave that material on the campus than trying to get it off. Although I will also add that we have not done a thorough analysis at this point to make sure it's suitable right, for what yeah. purposes it's suitable I don't, for. So it, it will be a It's a not engineered at all, is it? So um, We don't know for certain. It was it, FEMA approved it for levy purposes, which hopefully is some indication of, of what's there. But there, it's an item we will have to discuss further. But you don't know the composition of the soil, if there's swelling clays in those soils? or Not at this point, okay. we don't. So, so yeah, I just uh, agree with Lisa and just encourage if we can work together to see like what are the the needs to you know build this thing with and could we use the soil on site and then can is that like a third of the levy fill and then you guys get all the rest of it or something so maybe we could do more engineering figure out how it might work and then and then talk more about it. Is it uh, here's a question? So you would like it because to fill in the other areas where you want to build, is that so it's, it's possible, but since we don't have any plans, that's why we held that in reserve, because maybe we want to use it to build up some of the land to make sure we stay out of the floodplains, or if we end up, you know, uh, if we you would, decided with the plan that you selected, we need to use some of the OSO area, maybe we need to put some fill there, who knows? Well, speaking of that, though, I mean, if there's going to be a few, a, a few years, we're going to build this thing in the next few years, the flood mitigation, and then you guys aren't going to build for a while. We might not want piles of dirt lying around, right? I mean, how is that going to work? Well, we did bring in piles of dirt that filled that site when um, the NIST facility was built. So, but I mean, we already you'd piled want dirt on that site. <laughs> I, my point being, you won't want to leave it in construction mode for years and years till you get around building. I don't know. It's just something to think about is how do you make the site look nice? Something to discuss, yeah. for sure. Yeah, okay. Anybody disagree with discussions on levy fill material? Okay. Um, around open space, um, these were areas that we think, you know, basically need either some clarification um, or, or some analysis needed down the road, um, really around um, open space conveyance, um, restoration activities, and around Dry Creek Ditch Number Two. And so, um, this map, and I have a large copy of the map, if if any council members wish um, to have that. Um, but on September 20th, council stated a preference um, for implementing the July Open Space Board of Trustees recommendations, and those recommendations included um, conveying um, several areas of the open space other um, site that are out lined here in this map, 44 acres east and outside of the levee, and that's that orange area, um, conveying 40 acres west and north of the existing CU levee to OSMP and restoring 17 acres as part of the flood mitigation project, that's that blue area, and then finally the purple area, support through the annexation, um, conveyance and permanent protection. Um, of the remaining open space area. And in their letter, um, the CU did state that any additional land requested um, for open space or other uses would need to be purchased by the city with the university's agreement. And so we'll need some clarification around to determine whether or not uh, and to what extent the university would be willing to um, entertain um, um, any of those discussions um, to implement the Board of Trustees recommendation to you. 
Um, additionally, the restoration activities, um, you know, the OSBT did recommend that all of the open space other be conveyed to um, OSMP or permanently protected um, as open space, and, and there's a conflict there with some of the guiding principles and what university has indicated they'd like to do in some of those areas um, that are less sensitive, and that would be around like community gardens, um, some recreational activities and solar gardens and so on, and so there's a little bit of a conflict there that I think we're gonna have to get some clarification around. Um, and then lastly, the analysis needed around the relocation, realignment, and potential water rights for the Dry Creek Ditch Number 2. Um, the OSBT did recommend realigning the ditch, and that's very conceptual um, through the middle there, um, almost as a demarcation line of that open space other, um, and that's not an official um, placement of that by any means. Um, in the letter, the university did say if they agreed, um, the, the city could at its sole cost realign the ditch and acquire or lease the university's rights, and so we'll have to have some clarification and some analysis around the objectives of where that would go and um, the feasibility of that configuration moving forward. And so these are some of the issues that we've identified with open space. Hey, in your letter you did say if the university agrees you can do it. I didn't quite understand what that meant. I meant... It, in terms of the realignment? Just how the sentence was worded. If the university agrees, then we'll allow you to go forward. So it's I think a, it would be was from the university. I, Anyhow, I, I think it would be a discussion, and particularly if we uh, turn over rights and those kinds of things, that's a regent <coughs> approval item that has to be taken to a vote of our regents. Okay, that's so, helpful. Okay. What? Yeah. How do you see those discussions going, or or how would we? What discussions are we referring to? Um, so just this this one, where you have two bullets. Uh, if the university agrees. The city may at its sole cost realign dry creek, dry creek ditch number two. And then your second bullet is if the university agrees, the city may acquire or lease the university's water rights in dry creek ditch number two. So my question is how would those discussions occur and when do you see those occurring? I mean, we would probably like to have our staff estimate how much it, does it cost to realign Dry Creek Ditch number two, um, you know, what's involved, but mm -hmm. where do you see the university and the city having that discussion? So I think we could have more definitive discussions with staff around that and what it looks like. You know, one of the questions um, we've got to ask for the long-term use of the water rights, are those something that we need to help manage the property and the water usage on the property once it's developed and therefore is it something we would lease now as opposed to sell and then take this entirely back to our regents to approve. I, I think when we were, you know, in the Open Space Board of Trustees discussion, I think they were also talking about making sure that the um, special species there had water in perpetuity you know, so that they could reclaim some of the land there, not reclaim it, but restore it, you know, ec ecologically. And so that could be, that. I, anyway, I, I see this as really a critical point, two points. So that would be another discussion, I think, if the, if the goal is to restore, you know, ecologically that portion of the university's land. Mm -hmm. Uh, with those, what, who's doing that, we, you know, what's it affecting, what are we, um, so I think that's a longer, mm -hmm. probably, discussion. Right, it, but it's a critical discussion that we're going to have to have. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how to take this letter if we say, well, there's this part of it we just have a difficult time with, yeah. or does it, is it going to require more discussions amongst the individual parties? Yeah, this part, uh, specifically the water rights, will require a considerable discussion because those are valuable rights and will become more valuable over time. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree. And so for us to give those up now is giving up something that was going to have increasing value over the future. So it's uh, not something that we can certainly agree to today. And as far as the uh, the realignment, I suppose it just matters what the path of the realignment is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the main thing I can see there. And, and if if we are retaining some use of that pink area, 
Is it crossing and then interfering with that use? Those are just a couple of examples of considerations. Okay, well that, things to be discussed then. Anything else on these? Um, so that was the last topic that we had proposed. Transportation. Um, Chan yes, and I was gonna say, council members started interested in that. Um, so we'll go ahead Great. and pull that up. Does everybody agree that we should touch on that? Well, no. yes, but I had a question. Okay. Um, on that last item on page four of your letter, where it talks about the um, wastewater, water and wastewater service agreement of January 1997. Just somebody explain to me what that is. Yeah. So this was a request by one of our engineers, and my understanding is that th there's a certain agreement of, about rates of water that apply to the main campus, and so we would like this to be, this campus to be designated as a main campus, so it can apply, that contract would apply. Which is what we've done on um, the um, conference center site, and I believe also the east campus site. This is consistent with those. So just to provide a little more detail, what we do with CU properties in general is we master meter at the perimeter of the property, and so, even though there might be multiple buildings on the site, we treat it as one customer. They have one water budget. They acquire plant investment fee to serve it as a whole. And so as they do individual things on the site, we're not, then they, they own and maintain the utility infrastructure within the site as well. So it, it tends to be more efficient moving forward, but it's different than a typical property where you would have a separate account and arrangement for each and every building um, and where the city would maintain the infrastructure within the campus. So what this is saying then is to add this to that contract basically. Yeah, and we'll have to look at the details of that. And actually the, the water rights issue we just talked about probably fits in that same conversation because typically through an annexation, the city would be acquiring any water rights the annexing property had in exchange for providing our own water rights to deliver potable water to the site. So we would be probably looking at, at that as a whole in terms of what CU is seeking from us in terms of provision of water service and what water rights we would be using for that. And it, so that's kind of our, our seat at the table in terms of the conversation about Dry Creek Ditch Number Two. So with the Dry Creek Ditch Number Two water rights come into this sort of analysis? Yeah, I think we would look at it yeah. as a whole. And again, we'd have to, as we move forward, we'll get a better understanding of, of what the likely needs are within the property, and but we would look at that holistically because it might be that there is some some trading that makes sense and is in everyone's mutual interest. Any? Lisa touched on it, but I just wanted to reiterate that the it's very important for open space habitat preservation in case that dam at the highway does not permit water passages. And that was the thrust of the realignment of Dry Creek Ditch 2 and having water in it. So just as a, a backup for to be sure that that habitat would be protected. In particular, the just groundwater to, movement. A, yeah. Yes, just to okay. underline that. So great, so just the time check. We wanted to talk transportation and then we still need to talk annexation process and we're supposed to get to Hogan Pancost at eight. So we're gonna, transportation. Yep. Um, okay. you know, there's, there's quite a few, there are quite a few points of alignment that we're seeing. Um, you know, the comprehensive plan talked about performance-based standards and so um, the university did indicate in, in their letter that they're interested in partnering with us to, f to further develop those. Um, you know, we've done some initial research around, you know, there are other universities that have done similar things out there that we could start looking at. Um, an initial study throughout the comp plan um, identified a potential location for a multimodal hub on the site, and that's something that we're in alignment with, um, as well as a connected multimodal system, um, it's connecting to our system, as well as not having a bypass through the site. Some of the things that we think we'll probably need to, to, to further refine is, is the impacts to the neighborhoods relating to the transportation. And so a lot of the, you know, those density numbers were in part developed through the land use designations on the site at the time, but also um, there was an indication that the ultimate number will be guided by an, an additional analysis for the carrying capacity of our transportation system. Um, and 
so we'll have to do a little bit more analysis on that. And there's also, we heard some concerns around, you know, there's a school nearby, um, there's some um, neighborhoods nearby that could be concerned around parking spillage and so on. And so, you know, we'll have to probably look at some more fine grain approaches to managing um, the university's trips and the subsequent impacts to the, to the neighborhood and our transportation system. So that's my intro. Cindy? So it, it's been managed, I mean, we're already hearing from the neighborhoods, have been hearing for decades from the neighborhoods about the level of service of transportation in that area. I mean, it's poor right now, and people have a difficult time just coming north or going um, east. So I would hope that the university really would look ahead at connecting its campuses doing something, maybe the Colorado, that CDOT right-of-way would be a place where some small fixed rail could go. And maybe the city could get into that. Again, looking ahead, this is looking ahead that we should explore Bob's gondola. Um, <laughs> these kinds of different um, things could be looked at that really might start to move people and goods instead of just putting more cars on the roadway, because they're not going anywhere soon. Much as we may think that that would be a good thing, it's not going to happen soon, unless oil dries up. Yeah, I'll, I'll absolutely agree with, with uh, Cindy there, and because so, um, obviously transit is going to need to be a huge part of the transportation plan here, and I, I really hope that we can work together and do some joint transit. Um, and the, so we've got the Table Mesa Park and Ride right there, and there are so many people, I'm sure, who could use some additional ways to get from there into downtown or to the CU campus or things like that. So I'd love to see us collaborate on circulator routes um, to, this, to this site. So hopefully we can build some of that into this negotiation process. And one thing I'd, I'll mention, um, the, I absolutely support the no bypass. We don't want cars going through there and over. But we, can we consider allowing maybe some buses to go through? I mean, that might actually be a good mobility option if you put one bus every 20, 15 minutes from side to side. That wouldn't violate, I think, the spirit of the um, no bypass rules. So I would want to hear from the public about that. I'm not going to try to do that unilaterally, but it's, it's, I think, an idea worth considering. If you can get better transit by allowing the occasional bus through, that might be worth considering. Um, I think CU wants to jump in. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, I would just like to say that uh, we are absolutely on board with collaborating on transit options, and that's part of the guiding principles as well. Yep, fantastic. Thank you. It's the beginning of our own yeah. transit authority. And there you go. <laughs> okay. And I was just going to say the same thing that Aaron just said, that I really hope we can see this as an opportunity, not just with this property, but I think looking into the future, CU, the city, Boulder County, we need to do something about transportation. And I don't think we can look to Denver for leadership. And so I'm hoping, I, I personally think we're going to have to have a whole lot of sidebar conversations. And I really hope we can have a very fruitful one on, on that. Yeah, as Derek said, I think we agree. Excellent. Let's talk about it some more. Oh, wait, let's not. Um, okay, so I'm just kidding. Um, annexation process. Perfect. Okay. Um, so that was the second question to council. Um, the purpose statement, um, the city's engagement framework does suggest clearly defining um, a purpose statement early on in a process or a project. Um, that's really intended. It's kind of like the project's mission statement. Um, this was the statement that was included in the staff report. I also did want to note, you know, um, Mary um, and Sam did provide some additional language, which I have on another slide if council is interested in that. But this is um, one of the things that we wanted to bring up um, to council for any input and even wordsmithing if you so chose to. And just said, in terms of process, what else are we trying to finish on this topic? The only other thing is to talk about the touch points with the community during the actual annexation process. So. With all due process, uh, I actually think that one's really in important and then we can come back and wordsmith this as perfect this time allows okay yep and okay. so this is just a reminder that we're at really at step one kind of defining the issue before embarking on this process 
following the input tonight, we'd be developing and further refining, you know, our understanding of the affected parties and engagement plan as we move forward. Um, typically in a conventional annexation process, there's several steps that take place, including a pre-application meeting with the applicant and staff, um, sometimes a feasibility study, the application submittal and written comments. Um, typically the annexation agreement would be refined during that process and once it's finalized and ready for prime time, it would go to planning board and city council. What the staff report um, suggests considering is um, really building upon the guiding principles and the input we, re we receive at tonight's study session. Um, we would be holding some um, additional meetings with the university. The university would be submitting an application for annexation um, and um, through written comments, we would seek to move some of those areas in the yellow as we've been talking about them tonight, seeing which areas move into the green, which areas still have that are unresolved um, or that have different varying options, uh, different ways to address them, and we would bring those to city council during a study session with a uh, plan for engagement. Following that, we would have an engagement process and as well with the city and, and, and probably county boards, um, and then share that input, input with council at a study session and then head into the board hearing process. So in a nutshell, that's what the, um, the, the memo for this meeting um, detailed. And we would be, um, this is kind of a first take at it, and so we're interested with any, any kind of input that council may have. Mary, Bob, Jill. The order of the items after written comments, I would just like to kind of get a feel from my colleagues about, um, it seems to me that we might want to get board engagement ahead of our study session. Um, and what I'm getting at, it'd be great if they dove in more deeply to that and then provided some feedback to council at a study session. So that's just a suggestion I have and I just want to put that out there. Okay. Uh, why don't you guys respond and add whatever you were gonna. I agree, Mary. I didn't know you were gonna say that, so I had a different point. Um, question for you, Phil, or maybe it's for Jeff. Um, to what extent are there dependencies between this annexation process and the engineering, the preliminary design work that you're doing? Are there, are there, are there any points where one is gonna affect the other or do they work completely independently? I am hoping that, that Phil might have a slide in the deck that just shows how the two overlap. And if you do not, then uh, so so basically, they have to line up at the end for sure. We we don't want to make a decision on annexation or or flood without knowing they both work. Um, I think the plan is to be checking in with council at key milestones through the engineering, and if we hit something that is going to require a, a policy decision or a change in direction. Um, we would need to bring that up and make sure that we don't get things out of sync. Um, Are there it, updates f on your side? Yeah, that would that's, feed into. Yeah, there's a there's a, a process laid out on when we would see updates, and the idea was, I think, to try to integrate those best we can. Um, but it really there's a there's a variety of different critical path items in the preliminary engineering, and if we hit a snag with any of those, we will want to come back and regroup so we don't get ahead of ourselves with this. So I get the, uh, the fact that these have to end at the same time and, and it sounds like you don't know if there's going to be dependencies between the two other than the fact that for the bumps in the road you'll let us know along the way. Um, are you, I think at one point in time in the last month or two you told us that you thought the preliminary design work would take about a year. That's the ballpark. Um, kind of the next big milestone is we're expecting in December to have the consultant to have brought the option that was selected by council up to just even the standards of the previous options you've looked at. So that will hopefully give us some insight if, if any fatal flaws have been identified. Great. And yeah. then Phil, are you, are you going to try to slot this process in during that same year so that they more or less in at the same time? That's our goal. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I have Jill, then Aaron, then Cindy. So you, my question was also about timeline. So this whole thing takes one year. That's what you're saying. That's the goal. 
That's our hope. Okay. Um, so I, I do agree with you, Mary, that we should change it. And actually, here's my big concern. This has been a great meeting, and there's a lot of head nodding. But when we get to here, it could blow up. And we know it will. I mean, we know it's a hot topic in the community. We've already heard from hundreds of people that they don't want anything to go there. And I just would hate, you know, one of the things that we heard loud and clear from you guys in the orange is the process leading here kind of stunk. And I agree. And, you know, I just would hate to go through all the head nodding and all this, and then nine, ten months from now, it blows up because of because of public process. Um, so I, I, I would like move all of that up, personally. Well, okay. when, when well can, can we call a clear on that? Um, at some point we need to have something with some specificity for both the public and the boards to respond to, because that's when the rubber hits the road is when you fill in the details. So how long do you think do we have enough details for people to respond meaningfully to and the boards to respond? And that's probably, as soon as we get there, that's when we should have it, I think. We, we would hope that we'd have some options for that first council study session. The idea would have been if there are friction points between at least the policies we have this, at the city and the university, that we're able to identify them and at least identify some specific paths forward and that's what we would be presenting that we would go out to do engagement around at that council study session. That's at and least our concept. When -ish do you think that would be? Like six months, five months, four Probably months? Probably at, at the first quarter of 2019, oh, okay. most likely. Um, and that also depends on, on you know, work with the university as well. So we, we don't want to put a date in, out there that, yeah. So okay, we I have Aaron and then clarification. Mary. Oh, good. Bill. So what I hear you saying, Phil, is that based on the written city comments, you would then identify um, issues from that, bring them to a council study session, and then um, based on council's direction, then take it out to engagement? That was our thought. Okay. But by the first quarter, you think we'll be there? By the end of the first quarter, not by the beginning of the not first Not by the quarter. beginning, but yeah. Well, I'm just I, trying to figure out. The yeah, question, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I still think that it could go to boards because it'll probably be things perhaps around transportation, perhaps around planning open space. I, and maybe that's where, you know, a joint meeting with them might be good too before you come to council so that they can do the deep dive in there. Yeah, I mean, I think that that makes sense that, that there could be a joint board session could be a good idea before we have our next study session. And this is after we have some more specifics to look at. And, and then you go out for public engagement after that, right? So then we're talking about like open houses with the publics, things like that. We'd probably look at Beard Boulder, um, um, a larger public event, and probably some smaller focus groups as well. Right, which is, I think, really useful. And then, and then I, I think, we should consider making that second council study session a public hearing. I'll just put that out there. Like, I'm a little worried about getting to our very first public hearing on the issue when we actually have an annexation agreement in front of us that we're about to consider approving. It's probably a little late. It is a little late. It's a lot late. Okay. So I, 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 I encourage us to, to have a chance to hear from the public as a council uh, before we get to that end point. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah, that goes directly to Jill's point about getting all the way to the end and having it blow up. Exactly, That's yes. I also yeah, ask well, a, that was well a point of clarification around the board involvement. I've heard, I think I've heard a couple of different things. Would council prefer the boards weigh in prior to that first study session or, or after that? That was what Mary was yeah. proposing. Okay, I think there's making sure I heard that, that correctly. Yeah. Okay. I guess here's, here's the thing is, it depends, I think, a little bit. If we hit some snag, if it's about, if it's a technical sn snag and there's different ways to solve technical stuff, yeah, send it to RAB. But if it's a political one where you want us to say, hey, we want to, we want to run this by the public, that's us. So I guess, depending, I'm with you, but it depends on the nature well, of the options sense. that you want to float by us. We that's may also suggest an IP at the end of the year to kind of tell you where we're at. Well, so. well, 
But, okay, wait a minute. And I, I had one more thing, but we can keep talking about this. Okay, let's oh, wrestle I, this one. Mary and then Lisa. I just wanted to put this out there. Perhaps we would like to have a process subcommittee. We, we could just throw the current comp plan process so we can give them this one too. <laughs> Not comp plan, the land use code. The so good. Open space. What? No, not that one. Well, oh, okay. What it was? What were you going to say? Is it relevant to this part? To we? No, I was just going to hold the thought. Um, I mean, what you said. If you say no, it's not relevant, then don't say. Um, well, it's like, what am I answering? <laughs> well, simply, when we want to go to boards before or after the study session with us. <coughs> Is there anything else on that one? I think it would be good to go before, let the them weigh in, before. yeah. But but maybe with the, if there's a threshold political question, send it to us first. Yeah. And okay, yeah. does that sound right to everybody? Okay, we're gonna go back to let Aaron finish, go ahead. Okay, the, the other one I w wanted to say kind of where Bob was going in terms of how the flood planning and, and this process works together. Just, uh, I very much want to make sure that we don't unnecessarily hold up the flood work. So, I mean, I can imagine a scenario where flood is kind of working along and they're like, oh, we actually aren't quite ready for this because the annexation thing isn't quite ready. And then you end up in a holding pattern for two months. You know, let us know. You know, if, if, if something like that seems like it's coming down the pike, um, let's see if we can work to avoid that, because I think we want to make sure that the flood engineering work doesn't take any longer than it has to. And so, I mean, we have to work through the annexation pro process. We have to do a good job with that and a thorough process, thorough job on that, but uh, to the extent that we can avoid having that hold up the flood work, please, and come back to us if necessary. To that end, the, the slide that Jeff was hoping that you had that you don't have. Can you make us one that shows how they're going to link up and where the updates will make sure that, oh, we're, we're still in alignment. Oops, we're, we're getting out of alignment so that we can intervene. Um, that would be helpful, I think. Okay, Lisa, your other thing. Okay. Um, well, anything else on the process then? There was. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Just a question. So we have application submittal, and maybe Phil, you can answer this. We get written comments back about where we're in alignment and not, and we resubmit. If it then goes to all of the engagement boards and then city council study session, it just continues on. We never um, take advice from that and consider what we would, might be willing to change and resubmit or. Yeah, and this, this figure doesn't include that, but in the memo, it, we did have a, you know, following the study session, there would probably be a, some additional, our attorneys and your attorneys would likely need to be, um, as well as staff. Mapping yeah, out the agreement. Yeah. yeah. And then they that actually standards. mapped out agreement would then be before the final hearing. Yes. Yep. That yeah. would be the final agreement, but typically at the, written comments stage, um, we are identifying kind of what the conditions of annexation are going, to be, are, are going to be and where there is alignment with the city staff and the applicant. So that's after that written comment stage when you start to move into the process, that's where that will start to emerge. But if I can just say, I would hope CU stays involved in all of this and when our boards make comments or something, that you certainly have an opportunity to see what those boards are saying and have an opportunity to weigh in. I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume we should be working together all the way through the yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't there going to be a draft or at least pieces of a draft that that's what this public is responding to, right? Yes. Okay. But that will be that will be emerging at that after the written city comments. You know, as part of that process, that's where the city the city will kind of stake out its position. The city staff will. Yeah. So what can you remind me what the second council study session is for? 
because I see that it, what I've heard so far is that you look at you're looking at moving the engagement before the council the first council study session, and the second one. Think of that as a public hearing. Um, I think that one. Oh, I see. Okay. I think we were looking at boards before the first study session, and then public engagement in between the study session and the public hearing. But you would have input from your your boards and, and commissions prior to having that study session on those those key issues. We would go out to the community and have additional have engagement, um, and then that council public or that council study session would turn into a public hearing and would really be looking at um, a potential path forward with those key issues and weighing in on that. And then does it end in a board hearing? Well, here, you know, we had included the boards at this stage of the process, but really this would be kind of moved up up here. And that and that may include the open space board, if, if they're, given that there's those open space issues, transportation advisory board, and so on. Um, and then the final public hearing with planning board and council. So. Too bad we can't move this around on the fly. Yeah. Sorry. Well, and I think with maybe the caveat that if it starts, we may have to mm -hmm. tinker with this if for instance, there are some key issues that we're going to just take more public process or something, right? Absolutely. And the, the final thing that we had, and we're not too much over our time, was that um, purpose statement and whether or not council wanted to dive into that tonight or if that's... Um, we, we remain ready. Well, maybe you guys had proposed some changes, and to me the wordsmithing is less important than the concepts that you wanted to change, and I don't know if the discussions that we've just had, like, okay, so we're not doing site review, but we want more detail, whether that affects what you're proposing or not. Um, but either way, it, maybe you could talk through the, the key things about this that you wanted to change kind of at, on a, at the principal level, not like every word. Yeah, so one of the one of the things that Sam and I spoke about was that this one, um, the purpose of this process is to annex. And I, you know, it, that is something that the, that the public would react to. And so we wanted to change that um, to define the conditions of annexation as opposed to presuming the end result before it's gone through a process. So that's one of the major things. Um, and then the, the, the language that followed from there was um, would instead of will. Um, so that's another major um, principle, I guess. And then um, finally, the, the involvement of the community. So um, those are the things, and I guess um, I'd like to understand um, exactly <coughs> where your concerns, Francis, were. Um, so we had written a response to this, and, and really it was um, would include but not be limited to agreements that clearly define the building standards and uses, transportation access and connections, flood mitigation, ecosystem protection, and land stewardship responsibilities. All of that is something that we um, wouldn't want to define in the annexation process itself. We would want to agree to a process in the future to engage the city in providing feedback on those things when we get to that stage, but not in the annexation agreement itself, defining those standards. So that kind, those items kind of mirror the um, general principles, uh, guiding principles in the comp plan, the, the agreement topics? I, and I, then I think we could say it should be guided by the 2015 guiding principles. And then period. Mm -hmm. It's for not going to... I mean, we, we like the original one that the staff recommended, but this is your purpose statement. Well, I guess one, one question... Well, one question is, do we need to list all the topics if they're in the principles or not? Do people have thoughts on that? No, I mean, the, princ the principles are pretty extensive, and we all agreed to them. And, and they're covered, so yeah. I just think it, 
you know, to belabor it, I think it's already said. So I would just put a period after principles. Okay. So that takes us back to the other one. Um, what about this notion of the purpose of this process is to define the conditions versus the purpose is to annex? Yeah. Depends on which process we're talking about. It seems to me the purpose of the process is to um, ultimately annex the property for the benefit of the city and its flood mitigation project and for the benefit of the university. That's what it is. Um, how we get there and what the agreements are that we make to finalize that have yet to be fully determined. That needs to be worked out between our legal counsels and others. Other thoughts or opinions? Yeah, I'll jump in here. I, I don't think I don't think what you're saying, Francis, and what Mary is saying are mutually exclusive. I mean, I think I think we all get that there can be no flood mitigation unless there's annexation. So I think. I think the, the assumption is that this will end up in an annexation. I think what Mary, the point that Mary's trying to raise is, what are the what are the terms of that condi that annexation? None of us know, right? We've talked about some tonight. There's probably some yet to be talked about. And so I think, I think what Mary and Sam are saying is, is the process is about what are the terms and conditions of that ultimate annexation? And so I don't think you, you all are. In well, I, th I think that's I think that's right, and and I I think I would agree that. It's not mutually exclusive, and um, I also think that this language is more um, um, cognizant of um, the importance of this project to the community. So maybe I have a, a proposal here, which is I, I think I think your your and Sam's uh, initial sentence is. I think broader, and I, I think works well for uh, the needs of the process, and 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 in general. And then, but I wonder if we might go from that first sentence back to the original purpose statement. So that this pr original purpose statement only has two sentences, and so maybe we take your first sentence and then the original purpose statement's second sentence. Which uh, do you? Can you bring that back back up? The, <clears throat> So, so this, since the first like half of that first sentence would be replaced by Sam and Mary's, and then we'd keep this second sentence, which has the sort of clear, will be gui guided by the CU South guiding principles, and then it's clear that it's a modified annexation process that provides opportunities to influence the terms. So I'm with that, it begs another question. This one talks about balancing, and I noticed that Mary, you and Sam took that out. Um, as a concept and just has we're going to meet both? Well, I think the one that... Did you that guys do that on purpose? It's more aspirational, really, because this one is... We know that there's going to be give and take, but I think that in the other the proposal, it's we're going to aspire to get to a point where we meet everybody's needs. I'm just going to state a preference, which is this one, because I like it cleaner um, rather than not just shorter and more. It leaves room in there, but at the same time, it also has specificity. Well, what about the first portion of your sentence, of the first sentence, Here's which the I first. like? Yep. The purpose of this process is to define the condition of annexation for the parcel is CU South. Which is fine. And in so doing, I mean, to me, just say, it is a tr it is a balancing, right? Mm. So I I think admitting that there's going to be some trade offs and there's some give and take is being most clear. So, but I like your first part of your sentence. What about that? Yeah, I like that. Like, oh, yep. Uh, so if you go back to the other purpose statement. This is completely a matter of semantics, but it's uh, where it says University of Colorado's potential South Campus. We consider it already our South Campus. I think it's after CU South. Go to the other one. So the, it just use the portion of this through what drop off? the word okay. CU South. Oh, so, that, okay. so we could avoid that. We're not doing the whole yeah. first sentence. Does that work? That makes sense. <laughs> so will we get to see it again and make sure that yeah, we agree on it because it's, yeah, yeah. We'll have a summary of the study session, um, and we'll include it in that. 
that specific language. Yeah. Okay. Does that work for people? And we can touch on it there if if some somebody's really askew, but it's sounding like we ha are having a meeting in the mind, so that might be good enough. Thank you. That was a lot to cover in two hours. We really appreciate your time this evening, though. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to say to see you really appreciate, uh, well, actually, I think you requested to come here, and I think that was a great idea. Yes. So really appreciate your engagement, and this is a great way to have a conversation. Well, thank you very much for doing this. We really appreciate it. I'm speaking sincerely for the whole university that we think this has been a good process, and you know, I think we are good partners. We are good models for other cities and universities that haven't quite got it as together as we do. Well, well and if we need to do this again later, yeah. maybe we maybe we should. Yeah. So. Great. Okay. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And um, yeah. I was going to reach out to you about the Harvard House. Absolutely. So yeah. Yeah. I want to uh, pick up conversations about the other day. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, we were I thinking about what could be possible. It's a possibility, but I'd like to explore that further. So, but anyway, great job. Thank you. Back at you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I think Dan should sit near the computer. I was told to sit here, but it depends on the order of the presentation. Pass the microphone okay. down. So, Dan, we're going to have you sit by the computer. Me? You. And you're going to need to run my slides. Okay. 
up there. Oh. I did, and I was sort of hope Bill that Anne was gonna take her, but she didn't get back to you. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Yeah, it is annoying that somebody would ask you at such a late date. I mean, we've got the flag, but if the guy's a recycler, you'd like... Well, I just like, I thought about putting my hat on. I don't know. <laughs> Could be funny. So what time is it? Maybe I should give him one of these. No. Very good. Um, I know. There are like three of them. We can get something done by 4.30. Right. But you're right. The answer is no answer. No. Yeah, this is actually a funny one. Yeah, it, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. All right. We have five of us. Shall we begin? Yeah, we're going to begin. Everybody's just refueling. But we can hear you in there, too. Okay. We'll get going. I'm going to kick it off. And obviously we're here to talk about potential uses for Hogan Pancost, a property that the city recently purchased at the direction of council. Um, on to the next slide. So our goal tonight is to give you an update on what's been going on with the Hogan Pancost property. You had requested that we return to council after purchasing it um, in October, so here we are, to talk about potential uses for the property. And we have brainstormed, I thought you could see in our memo, that we tried to think of all sorts of different uses that we could make of this lovely piece of property. And some of them, I think, are probably fairly inappropriate, but it was a brainstorming effort, and we're going to rely on council to narrow things down. Um, after we go through all of those potential uses, then Carl Geiler is going to talk a little bit about the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. This area is now an area two, and there are, depending on which uses you select, it could move into other areas in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. And then we're going to ask you to narrow the potential uses. So um, one thing bef before I go further, you do a piece of paper on your desk, w which was also in the memo. And what we're going to ask you to do, just to follow along and f to help yourselves really figure out what you want to do, is as we go through each use, think about whether or not you want to do it or you don't want to do it, and then we can talk about it later. You will see that under number two, ecological or amenity management uses, use four, it already says yes. That's because the minim that's the minimum that we feel we should do as the owner of this property. We do need to maintain it. So we've already selected that it, at least we have to do that through the general fund. So. On this slide, we also contained a very short description of what's been going on in the property for the last year. As you well know, this property has a long and storied history that we are not going into. But just in the last year, um, the council considered an annexation application a year ago. Um, it was ultimately withdrawn. And then the council made the decision for the city to purchase the property. And we have been carrying through with that in the early parts of 2018. 18, and um, the property was ultimately purchased on April 20th. Uh, we're returning now, six months later, with some ideas for its use. And on to the next slide. So our questions for you are going to be, first of all, do you have any questions about what we're presenting? But then, do you have any suggestions for use of the property that we haven't thought of? Um, there there are probably are other things that you may be thinking about. Are there any uses that we've suggested that you think should be eliminated? And then after eliminating on the ones that could be used, um, do you have any additional information that you want us to provide that we can come back to you at a later time? And then do you have any specific questions about the potential uses? So um, on we go. The first presenter is going to be Dan Burke. And you can see our many staff members lined up in the order in which they're going to present. Oh, so we've asked there? each person to present their own section of it. And Dan Burke is going to talk, talk about agricultural and ecological uses. Dan. Thanks, Jay. 
Um, so over the uh, past many years, uh, Open Space staff have, has actually uh, had the opportunity to assess the uh, values the property has in fulfilling the open space charter purposes several times. Uh, most notably in 2008 when the landowner actually approached the department to uh, inquire about our interest in acquiring the property. In 2016 when the site development review application was before the city. And again most recently in late August, early September in preparation for the city council meeting. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, our most recent assessment, uh, which was done by staff about a month ago or so, really concentrated on these two open space uh, related uh, uses, which is agricultural and ecological. So in terms of its, eco uh, in terms of its agricultural uses, uh, overall staff felt, staff's opinion is that the potential of this property is relatively low from an agricultural perspective. And it has to really do for several reasons. It's rocky, poor soils, it's size, shape, and residential setting, uh, the conditions of the irrigation system, the current use of the property for horse grazing and boarding, the likely, that, uh, the likely of having low interest we'd receive from a potential rancher or agricultural uh, tenant to manage the property, and the fact that the capacity it would take to bring this property into the, our portfolio of agricultural lands uh, would divert resources from higher priority agricultural pro projects that are now before us. However, staff did develop an approach um, if council did determine that agricultural use is the highest and best use uh, for this property. And what this would look like is that this approach would be a limited agricultural restoration that would ultimately result in small-scale grazing and hay production. Uh, to do this, it would require removing the current structures, adding and repairing the fencing, um, repairing the irrigation system, which is dilapidated, and relocating the prairie dog colony. And eventually, it would involve renovating the pasture grass and reducing the presence of invasive weeds on the property. We estimate that the upfront cost for this uh, to get it ready for agricultural use could be as high as about $240,000. When and after that, with annual maintenance costs of uh, ranging around $12,000 a year. So, with this option, with this limited agricultural use option, uh, agricultural use uh, to a small de degree could be reestablished. The aesthetics of the property could be improved, and the invasive weeds issue would be addressed. Uh, however, this option would be expensive and we will likely find it difficult to find an agricultural uh, leasee or tenant or a rancher or farmer to take, this, uh, to take this on. And again, it would divert our limited resources. Our agricultural staff is of three manages our 15,000 acre system under our agricultural portfolio, which is actually a third of our open space um, portfolio as it exists now. Yeah. Do you know when the last time it was farmed? That property? Well, right now there's horses boarding on the property, but uh, I mean, many years ago it was part of a, lar a, 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 right. a, lar a larger system, which it, it was it, it was a viable agricultural property. The, in, you in don't have any information on when the last time they used it. It's not it's really. not yeah. critical. Yeah. Um, next, staff uh, assessed its uh, uh, ecological or and amenity management um, um, conditions. And very similar to the agricultural aspects, staff determined that, uh, that it provides low potential for possessing significant ecological benefits. And it's relatively, and that's the fact that is due to that this, it's surrounded by residential use on, on two sides and urban park uses on the third side. The condition of the property and, and the extent of the invasive weeds really limits its potential and its current conditions of, uh, of ecological viability and the likelihood that only generalist wildlife species would ever exist here due to the, due to the setting of the property. However, staff did develop four possible approaches if council did determine that managing the site for its ecological services is at the highest and best use for the property. So I'll, I'll briefly go through those four. Uh, first option is a limited or what we would call light ecological restoration projects that would be under the auspices of open space and mountain parks. And this would require removal of the structures, fencing repair or possible replacement, and mowing of the weeds. We estimate an upfront cost of about $65,000, of up to $65,000 to do this re uh, restoration. This light restoration would result in the management of the weeds and would result in aesthetic improvements to the site. However, it would divert staff resources away from higher priority restoration projects and in the end would result in only uh, limited ecological benefits due, due to the uh, prevailing conditions of the property. 
The second option, which would be, it would be more of a full or intensive ecological restoration initiative, again, under the auspices of open space and mountain parks. And this would involve many of the uh, 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 scenarios that I just brought up under the light, uh, under the minor restoration, but it would also inv involve additional activities such as site grazing, plantings, and wetland west restoration. An, an intensive restoration project could cost uh, as much as $410,000 and will result in aesthetic improvements and improved habitat. However, such a project, again, would uh, div uh, uh, divert our limited restoration-related capacity away from higher projects. And really, uh, the staff felt that the rate of return versus investment costs would be limited. So looking at a third option, which would involve OSMP restoring, incorporating into the OSMP system a portion of the property. And those would be the three acres lying to the east of 55th Street. And there is a poster board up to the right that in red, which would show those three acres uh, uh, that could be incorporated into our system and, and doing a restoration on those three acres. It is our staff's opinion that of all the 22 acres, that incorporating these three acres into the system makes the most sense due to its connectivity to open space lands that are uh, adjacent to the east. Uh, there's actually about 75 feet that have a common boundary on the uh, far east side of the hogan Pancast property. And under this scenario, OSMP uh, would also take a, a, a minor, uh, take, uh, carry out a minor restoration project. And finally, we did also look at what we were calling amenity maintenance of the property. And Jane alluded to that a little bit in her opening remarks. And this fourth option, is uh, it would be similar to a light ecological restoration project, uh, but it would not be carried out under the auspices of OSMP, but another city department such as Public Works, and it would be done to more of an urban standard as opposed to a city-managed open space. This option would result primarily in more frequent mowings of the property, uh, which would result in better aesthetic improvements in line with a more urban open area setting. You can think of an HOA type of common lands, uh, that type of setting. Um, however, it should be pointed out that even with amenity maintenance, that, that would uh, divert contracting dollars away from um, other community maintenance needs. But as Jane did allude, that probably is a primary responsibility to at least do that amenity maintenance on the property. So those are the options that we looked at and, and sort of a summary of staff's assessment of the property. So we can entertain questions on, on this section at this time. Just questions. Can, on option four, can you just tell me how that, um, what does that do for the noxious weeds and the prairie dogs if you're constantly mowing? I mean, is it going to help mitigate the weeds and is it going to impact the prairie dogs? Yeah, um, the, the mowing definitely will be a, uh, a weed mitigation um, process. The prairie dogs would be able to be stayed on site, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, the, the prairie dogs you could. Oh, I'm sorry. Don D'Amico, um, Open Space Mountain Parks. Um, so the prairie dogs could coexist under this scenario. Um, the mowing um, really wouldn't affect um, their ability to persist there. Okay, great, thank you. So, so um, in terms of op use number three, give, giving those three acres to the open space system, you said there's about a 75 foot contiguity on the eastern side. It, is there any other uh, private land use to the east of that parcel to the east of 55th, or is it really all open space as you kind of go east and northeast? Yeah, if you would walk onto the open, if you, if you would go across that 75-foot border onto open space, it's, it's pretty significant open space lands from the, uh, that point forward. Great, thank you. So, could someone tell me how many are in the colony, the prairie dog colony? Well, we estimate about eight to 10 acres right now is occupied with uh, with prairie dogs. I don't know if we've done an estimation or a count of- Per acre. And um, in terms of the vegetation there, um, it's, I've been out there recently, but it's kind of denuded or rocky. And so I guess I'm wondering if there would, I went to this, um, uh, she can stay down there. Um, <laughs> I went to a really cool uh, eco-cycle fundraising type thing where it was at a farmer's ranch and then next to it was open space. And open space is doing an experiment right now. Yep. And on that property, um, 
I guess it eventually could be agricultural. And Lauren uh, Kolb mm -hmm. was there, and she was explaining this key line technique yes. that had been very, is seeming to be very successful on that property. Right. And um, in fact, to the point that it's been able to um, irrigate the soil enough so that when you cover it with a cover crop or a variety of different cover crops, which is I think what they did in the experiment to see who's, who's gonna do better, those cover crops seem to keep pace with um, the prairie dogs. And, and so I'm wondering if some kind of treatment like that would be beneficial to improving the look of the land as well as maintaining the prairie dog population and keeping it vegetated. Mm -hmm. So it's a question. Yeah, my understanding of the pilot project on the Bennett property, uh, which is just uh, the single project that is that is going on right now, and, and we'd be happy to update the council on on the results of, of that. It's a, a couple years project, but uh, we'll be starting to get some results in, in pretty soon, and we'd be happy to update the uh, council on that. Um, that is, uh, that particular site was uh, selected for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it had, uh, the soils were, were blowing away, essentially. In the case of the Hogan Pancost, uh, there's poor rocky soils, but that is generally because that's the condition of the soils in general in that area being in that location where the Bennett property has is, is, is lost a lot of the uh, soil cover and therefore cannot hold any irrigated water. and. Et cetera. We also benefit from the fact that the adjoining rancher uh, or farmer uh, family yeah, is farmer. taking on a lot of the actual work uh, in order to, uh, um, so a lot of the people power is, is being done in partnership with a rancher. So it's not to say that this site w is ruled out, it, it wouldn't be, it, it could be considered for something like that, but there are certain conditions that are happening on the Bennett pro uh, property that isn't repeated here. But in talking with, uh, Brian Anneker from our staff who's leading that project, he said, in general, there's nothing that would rule out this site for a potential uh, pilot project of carbon sequestration, soil rejuvenation type mm -hmm. of thing, mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, so um, thank you for the presentation. I heard you say that basically the only part of this parcel that could become open space is the or that would be acceptable open space um, would is the part on the other side of 55th Street, that three acres. And, and so that being the case, um, it sounds like the other options, if we kept it in area two, um, would be either utilities or parks, is would that? Is that That's correct? We're going to hear about next. Well, if I could just oh, okay. clear, yeah, we'll hear about all the other options. I just want to clarify that uh, we did present options one and two, which would involve the full 22 acres, but staff's assessment is that the most appropriate uh, portion of the property to be incorporated is the three acres. But uh, the other, the option one and option two that we uh, purchased, as well as the agricultural option, would involve the full 22 acres. So it's, uh, I, I wasn't meaning to eliminate open space's ability to acquire, or to take on the rest. We, we just felt from a staff perspective that it, the th eastern three acres is, is what makes, uh, th th that would make the most sense from the staff perspective. Okay, that clarifies it, yeah. thank you. Yeah, bye. Sorry, just one other question. Um, in the memo, it stated that the land was, as Lisa stated, denuded and from the prairie dog grazing and the um, horse gra grazing. So, uh, or teasel or whatever that is, but it's way high, just just so we're clear. So, which seems to be the majority of the landscape. Am I correct? Yeah, the majority of the land is noxious weeds. Yeah. Okay. Hey, um, just one last question on this. It seems to me that we might say, hey, we could do some of this, some of this, some of this as a, a big site. Would it be appropriate if we chose some of these uses to to do the remainder? restored or uh, try out a carbon sequestrate, uh, augment with compost and see if you couldn't rebuild the soil. I mean, is there a, aside from the three acres for the rest of the site, is there a size at which you wouldn't bother? 
Yeah, I think that's what, uh, after tonight, if we get clarity that you would like more definition of which types of uses could go, could they go together, and if so, how would it look? That's what we would come back to you and, and, and provide some more detail. I have a question about this, um, specifically because it's this three acres of land. We got a letter from someone named Joe Kent, who talked about wishing to purchase this three acres and saying that he would do something it sounded like to the equivalent of a conservation um, agreement. Has that been entertained? I mean, the, for the city to sell that if there is a conservation easement on, on the This is the it? first we heard was that email. Would, so we have not pursued it at this point. Well, I would hope just thinking about it since this is kind of marginal land to begin with, if he would leave that open, that that would be something that we would look at if we can get a conservation. Yeah, if council would like us to, we can totally look at it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ken had never contacted us before that email. It came, yeah, either today or yesterday. I believe yesterday. Joe Kent, K E N. But if any, but he has con property contiguous to the property and is looking just to have access to his process to his property. If I understand it right, maybe I think the that's staff correct. knows more about it than I. I don't. Yeah, I, I just, just read the letter. I just read the letter too. Right. I thought that's a nice offer. Okay. Why don't we keep going? Contestant number two. So I'm Jeff Haley uh, with, with Parks and Recreation. Um, and so similar to open space in Mountain Parks, we've explored a lot of brainstorming <coughs> ideas. Um, and as we were just mentioning, a lot of the uses we've considered would complement other uses or be standalone. Um, probably most importantly, we've looked at the adjacent um, East Boulder Community Park to see what uses could be that don't exist there now could be improved on the site. So just to start the, a brief context setting, this area of Boulder, Southeast Boulder, is actually pretty well served by parks and rec amenities. The rec center is there, the East Boulder Community Park, several different neighborhood parks. And so we're meeting all of our service criteria about proximity, how close is a park to the neighbors, that sort of thing. Um, you know, there's other parts of town that are not served as well, um, most notably Gun Barrel, some areas of North Boulder. So. We started out just with that aspect and looking at what amenities don't exist and what should we do to serve this area. And so we're pretty well parked, um, so to speak, in terms of this area of town. Um, the other thing is we also refer back to our um, Parks and Rec Master Plan. That really is our guiding document as we've um, discussed a lot over the years. And it really includes our capital investment strategy in terms of what amenities need to happen throughout Boulder based on the, the neighborhoods and the residents. And so we've taken that into account as well. And then finally, I would just mention before we get into the actual options we've explored, we really do have this goal of taking care of what we have. So over the past several years, since that master plan was adopted, we've been spending most of our capital dollars on taking care of existing assets. Um, I simply mention that because any new amenities within this site uh, would be new assets that we would need to understand what that full operational um, cost would be. Um, as the slide indicates, we look at cradle to grave, um, and you'll see in a moment we included capital cost as well as what it would take to operate certain types of amenities. So we want to always keep that in mind as we're um, considering capital projects. So with all the options, um, as Open Space and Mountain Parks describe, We've also looked at what would need to happen with each of these. So regardless of the option presented, um, if council, again, with all these um, departments presented, if there was interest, we would need to look in much, um, much more in depth at the feasibility related to the site. Um, each one of these options may require additional amenities such as parking, um, infrastructure, utilities, that sort of thing. Um, and again, what the, the capital opportunities would be in terms of funding. Um, are we building an amenity that's already planned for another location in town? What that impact might be on that neighborhood, et cetera. So for all of those, um, instead of repeating that over and over, that's just kind of the overall considerations we explore. Um, so first off, skate parks and pump tracks. So um, there's a couple different amenities um, that we don't have in Boulder that much. Um, at Scott Carpenter Park, we do have a skate park. And of course, at Valmont Bike Park, we have pump tracks. But these are both amenities that are highly desired across the community. They serve a growing um, population of all ages. 
Um, a lot of folks in our community are asking for more skate parks, pump tracks. Basically, these are opportunities that kids, adults, et cetera, can um, participate in sports individually um, or with groups. And so these are opportunities that could be um, improved on the site um, and serve a lot of those needs and trends that we're seeing. Um, these are improvements that are planned currently for Valmont City Park within some of the future phases. Um, so that might have an implication on how quickly we get to that plan and that project. Um, but in general, we look at, um, if we were to do these improvements, it would be about 1.7 million in terms of capital cost. Um, that includes the skate park, the pump track, and a lot of associated infrastructure, and likely be about 50,000 annually to operate that. Um, and again, these are rough estimations based on initial analysis. You're presenting them as they go together or separate? This would be an idea that could go together. Um, the 1.7 is for both of them, but they, they could also be split up. True, okay. exactly. And Jeff, yeah. are you saying that there's a skate park eventually planned for Valmont Park? Correct. We've explored, you know, adventure type of sports similar to the bike park that's near, there now. Uh, we do need another skate park, a new and improved skate park in Boulder, and that would be the location. Okay, but you're not thinking of another pump track at Valmont Park, though, with the one right across the street, or, or maybe... Correct. Yeah, yeah so most it's about the skate park that you're thinking about. That's right. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the clarification. Okay. Um, disc golf and pickleball courts. So, again, just to supplement or complement, rather, the East Boulder Community Park, um, disc golf is also a, a highly valued sport within our community. We have a course at Harlow Platts um, Community Park as well as Valmont. Um, but again, this is a sport that could be um, provided or accommodated here on the site, um, either a nine hole or an 18 hole course. Um, basically nine holes would require about 10 to 12 acres. Um, 18 holes require closer to 20 acres, so it takes a fair amount of land. Um, both of these sports are similar to skateboarding and, and these pump tracks or these bike tracks. These are new, um, not necessarily new, but current trends in sports and activities within Boulder and really across the nation. Um, again, each of these amenities would complement the, the community park right next to the, to the north. Um, and uh, what we've looked at for the cost on there uh, would be about two million probably for capital. Now that sounds like a lot, but that really incorporates design, permitting, infrastructure, utilities, some small parking area, um, plazas, some shelter, drinking fountains, all these types of amenities that go along just to get the, the infrastructure completed. And then about 40,000 annually um, for court repairs and maintenance, um, keeping the baskets um, updated and that sort of thing. Hey, is pickleball, I could be wrong, but the question is, are they raised like wooden courts on top of the ground? I thought the ones that, uh, North Boulder Rec or? Yeah, so the North Boulder Rec Center behind there is a platform tennis court. That's and that good. is the raised court that you're thinking of. Um, no, I not, guess I'm confusing the two. Yeah. And so, well, I guess, so per the drainage issues on the site, correct. I'm just curious whether a raised platform, I mean, you can play pickleball on anything. You can play out in the street, right? right? In fact, right now we, we provide pickleball at the rec center, so we stripe the indoor courts, the basketball courts, and allow folks to use that. Um, there's a strong desire and demand for pickleball courts, specific courts within the community. Um, we, we do some retrofitting of tennis courts to provide that, um, but this would be a new area where we'd provide full-on pickleball that, don't, that doesn't exist now. Right. We do have my, several. My question is, is there a way to do it on this site that doesn't involve drainage issues like a race court? We would have to explore that. That goes into some of the feasibility. Um, so we would have to look at the groundwater situation, the, the soils report. Um, at a minimum, we would likely be in, um, excavating and importing fill to have the appropriate um, soil content for the courts. But I think it could be provided here with further analysis. Yeah, yeah. When we put in the soccer fields, that's what we did, didn't we? we added fill at the east boulder community yeah, park yeah um there was some grading on the site right. and then additional measures um because there's synthetic turf fields that we had to provide a certain um subsurface condition with gravel right. and other things right yeah okay thanks yeah um so mentioning the the rectangular fields that's ac actually another option we've considered um 
currently there are two turf fields at the East Boulder Community Park, as well as a couple different just multi-use turf fields. Um, we did an athletic field study a few years ago and, and looked at the demand and um, provision of all of our um, fields, both diamonds and rectangles. There is a, a need and desire for additional fields as always. Um, Pleasant View provides a lot of opportunities. That's our premier uh, field. Um, but this could certainly be another option for the site. Um, just to give a sense of scale, if you, know, if you look behind at the, the poster, you can see the, the two green squares or rectangles already at, um, to just kind of see a sense of the scale of what that would require. Um, if yes. we did, if, even if we just didn't put another one in, are you guys wedded to doing those artificial turf fields? Not necessarily. Good. Yeah. Right answer. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of debate back and forth. Most, a lot of folks actually prefer the natural turf versus synthetic. It provides a more uh, maintenance-free, longer duration. You don't have to rest the fields and that sort of thing. But it does, yeah. the rubber, the synthetic material, yeah. Jeff, I can answer, interrupt you there. Yeah. I see on use three, you have listed just rectangular fields. Did you eliminate diamonds or is that still a possibility? Um, we, with this option, we basically looked at rectangle, um, just given the, the constraints of the site and given that there's already a lot of the rectangular sports occurring with the other two, it would make sense to have another rectangle just because you have the, all those sports happening there. Uh, we could explore a diamond, um, depending on the size and the, the, the arrangement of that, um, it takes quite a bit more room. Um, but we, we didn't provide that in this option, but that's certainly, if council would like, we could explore that as well. When you did your um, field assessment, did, um, did you determine there was also a dearth of diamonds as well in the, in, in the city? There was a shortage of diamonds? Good evening, Council Yvette Bowden, Parks and Rec. Um, in addition, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, in addition, we did look at the need for one large diamond in the city. We don't have a lot of large capacity diamonds. The things about diamonds to consider, aside from the amount of space that it takes up, much to what Haley was pointing out, is it has a very limited use. If you're going strictly for baseball, the entire area would also have to be irrigated differently and managed differently, and we would need fencing around. Um, and so a lot of the infrastructure requirements are the same. You are correct, the athletic field study does call for a diamond, and that initially in our plans was something we were looking at at Tom Watson. Um, and we also want to consider kind of the implications that go along with who's using diamonds today and where they're using them. So I would want to look at that as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so another option is a running track. And so this, we don't currently have a public running track in Boulder associated with our department. Um, CU provides tracks, Boulder Valley School District has tracks. Increasingly, we're hearing from the residents of Boulder and our um, customers basically that access to those tracks is, is being more and more limited. So this could be an option, in fact, Back to the Valmont City Park plan, there is a track um, on that current concept plan um, to serve the community. We have a lot of um, runners in the community, as you know, and, and other field athletes. So this could be an option. However, it is expensive, um, likely about two, two and a half million dollars to construct a track. Um, again, there's a track nearby at Manhattan Middle School, I believe. In fact, the exhibit behind you over here, you can see it. Um, they actually just improved that this year. Um, so there's one nearby, uh, but again, this is just in terms of brainstorming ideas, this is another option to consider. Um, it would take up a, a fair amount of the site, however, and yes. So, so Jeff, do you know at, um, I think this is Manhattan Middle School, um, the BVSD did a whole bunch of new tracks and, and new fields. Do you know if this particular one is synthetic field? I believe it is. Yeah, and, they, they improved okay. that along with Centennial Middle School. Right, yeah, that's and right. And I, I think they are synthetic. Yep. Purposes. Yeah, they, I know the one at, at Centennial is. So I'll save that for my flood question next. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Um, so then the final option that we've explored, um, obviously community gardens um, are an option that we could consider in, in most sites across Boulder. Um, there are community gardens in the general area of Southeast Boulder that, that are managed by the neighborhoods or by growing gardens. 
other um, organizations. But typically this is a, an amenity that could be Im improved and provided to the site. We estimate likely to be about half a million dollars to build um, a nice garden area, similar to what you see at Foothills Community Park, or of course um, the Longs Gardens area um, where Growing Gardens is located. Um, as we were mentioning earlier about the soils and some of those discussions, we would likely have to bring in a lot of good topsoil or do the raised beds like you see. Um, most importantly with this option, we'd really, as a department, would seek to partner with a, an agency or the neighbors or, or whomever to really program and really make this successful. That's when we see, obviously, community gardens be uh, the most successful is when they are managed and operated by the community. Um, but again, like many of these options, it could be explored as in partnership with other uses as well. What, oh. Jeff, do you know where the nearest community garden, publicly available community garden is to this point? There is uh, Hick Hickory Gardens, I believe. Um, just it's it's right off of Foothills yeah. uh, Parkway and off of Baseline on Hickory Street. Yeah, it's just to the east. Um, and yeah, just east of Foothills Parkway in this in the general area. Um, oh, so my question is is. Um, so I, I worked for Growing Gardens and um, actually put in gardens, designed and put them in. So I um, was wondering, you uh, these typically need irrigation, Correct. and they're typically you put in um, just um, faucets to to serve a couple of plots and stuff. So what I'm wondering is the groundwater is really high in this area, and could that groundwater be used as the water source as opposed to um, city water. I might defer to the other, to the utilities of, to respond to that, <laughs> or even bring that up in your portion of the parcel. I'm actually looking at, at Don as the guy in the room that probably knows the most about plants. I imagine to a point, but it would, I assume it would depend on what you were growing and what the water table was at any given yeah. time. Well, I mean, how would you, how would you, uh, not in terms of can you use it to grow the plants, but can you use it to irrigate, and if so, how would you harness that groundwater to use it to irrigate? Oh, if you were going to actually pump it out and use it, you'd need a, a water right, and that would be a, a fairly elaborate process. I was assuming you meant is there enough groundwater that the plants would oh. take it up, and I, I couldn't tell you that. Mary, uh, Mary, the property has been acquired with three shares of Dry, Ke dry Creek Ditch number number two. Uh, that is a, a, a fairly good uh, uh, water right. Um, it would turn on around May 1st. It typically would turn off in late July. Sometimes it would extend into early August. So it would be appropriate for, especially for early season vegetables, maybe marginal uh, for late season. But uh, uh, it does have uh, water rights associated with the property. Thank you. Uh, how, what's what's a, the range in size that we, we might be talking about? Uh, I mean, it, it could be, depending on any size we would like, I would say probably three to five acres would be a, a large area. Um, it could be an acre, depending on okay. how many folks are participating, how large we want it. And we could certainly consider irrigation and those sorts of things. And that would... That would be half a million? Or and we're just estimating that based on, you know, the like you mentioned, irrigation, bringing in soil, yeah. um, some site work likely to, to provide that. Again, walking paths, et cetera. The half a million is kind of a rough estimate just based on a development cost. Yeah. Could you just say how big the community garden is up at Foothills? Is that an acre? Is that two acres? It's probably closer to two acres. I don't know exactly. I'd have yeah. to. Which one are you talking about? Yep. It, it's the one up at Foothills. It's pretty fancy. It's really cool. Right. It's very and that's actually that's what I had in mind when we were considering this in terms of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, again, we may provide a little parking area. Um, you know, a few things just to make it viable. But um, that's where the half five hundred fifty thousand came from. I'm looking online, it looks like there's uh, at Hickory Garden, there are 20 by 20 foot plots and there's 28 of them. And interestingly, they ran out at $100 a plot too, so they're pretty, 
potential income potent, uh, uh, to offset your capital outlay, right? Correct. If you if you charged. Is that a yeah. spot? That's the hickory. Yeah. Okay. And that's yeah, actually yeah. managed by growing gardens. Yeah, not necessarily. It just covers operating costs. It wouldn't. Well, cover. but it's 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 more than zero. We agree on that. More than zero. All right. Okay. Oh, I think we have been asking recreational issues. I guess the one the question I have is on all of these, like if you added a field, for, you know, you said, oh, we'll need bathrooms and it's right next to the rec center, right? So you, you wouldn't necessarily, I mean, it depends. If we were just going to augment with one, add one more field, I'm, I'm, I guess this is a question. It depends. If we were going to create lots of baseball diamonds, yeah parking lots, all that stuff. But if we were going to just add an incremental one more or two more things near closest to the rec center, don't we forego some of those other amenities that were listed and cut down on some of the costs? We could certainly explore that. Um, it's interesting how people don't want to walk too far to get to restrooms and parking. And, um, but, but certainly, if, if council would like, we could explore what the minimum cost would be and look at how we could get those fields as close to the park as possible. Um, but typically, and that's just general park design and planning, we look at, you know, when you have a certain amenity, all the associated features that go with it, just based on, you know, what's accessible to, to the yeah, folks. Yeah, I just was wondering how much we can piggyback on what's already there. Yeah, we could certainly uh, explore that. Okay, any other questions about, okay. Good evening, Council. I'm Kurt Fernhaber, Director of Housing and Human Services. So I'll be talking about four different um, options for housing. And um, this it's really um, based on um, sort of a concept of trying to do a lighter touch. Um, some of the earlier developments that were proposed were really trying to maximize um, the, the land with, with the housing. Um, and so we're, we're taking a lighter touch on both the land um, as well as um, ensuring that any, any approaches would, would be um, good uses of, of the, the energy for them as well. Um, all of these are sort of scalable, so they could, um, they could be combined with other uses like gardens um, as an example. Um, they could take up a portion of the site, um, a larger portion of the site, um, and there's also s sort of a critical mass for a lot of these as well, which is sort of re um, required. Um, we also looked at um, both the 100-year and 500-year floodplain, so there's, there's almost 18 acres of land that, that could be developed um, outside of the 100-year floodplain. In almost seven. Wait, how much did you say? Eighteen. Yeah, seventeen point nine acres, um, and almost eight, uh, seven acres um, outside of the the five hundred year um, floodplain. Um, also, we're, we looked at housing choices that could serve um, a, um, diverse populations um, within the city as well. Okay. So the um, the first one we looked at um, a tiny home village. Um, there's sort of two different categories of, of tiny homes. There's the small ones, and then there's the smaller ones. Um, and um, typically, the the ones 800 to 200 square feet often don't have um, plumbing in them, or they don't they don't have kitchens. Um, the larger ones um, uh, will have smaller kitchens and bathrooms. The idea around tiny homes, though, it's really a, uh, it's really a social community approach to housing where the, the tiny homes are often um, uh, integrated with some sort of common facility where um, you, could have, you could have bathrooms there, common kitchens, um, really sort of a, a co-housing type um, approach to housing. Um, so some of the um, things that would have to be considered, I think you can go to the next one there. Um, so there would be, um, there's some examples there, um, so you can see they vary widely um, when under the definition of, of tiny homes. But if they're fixed foundations, um, one of the considerations would be that we would have to look at the, um, the codes and regulations around that, particularly um, minimum sizes. 
um, if they're on um, if if they're not on fixed foundations, um, they they actually fit under sort of a um, a state um, requirement for the for the codes, not the not the city requirements. gives 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 them a lot more flexibility, um, and they can serve many different population types. They can serve permanent supportive housing. Um, they can serve seniors. Um, and you know various groups that make sense from a from a social standpoint as as well as from a from a housing standpoint. Um, so either one of these we would have to um, explore sort of the the impacts on our, our regulations and what changes would need to be made in order to um, accommodate this approach. And again, it's it's scalable, so it could be. Um, it could take up a couple acres or it could take up, you know, six or seven acres. Um, what I've found typically in working with um, co-housing type communities, that an ideal community is typically between about 20 and 35 homes. Um, once you start getting larger than that, it works, but they, you, you start creating almost sub-communities. And um, so council could consider, you know, different types of sub, sub communities. One set of tiny home, one tiny home village could be seniors, another could be permanent supportive housing, um, and you know, different different populations that meet this. We've also seen up in Vale that, um, you know, they they've had this for teachers. Um, so there are you know different populations that can use this housing type. It's not a question, but I think it's relevant. It, 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 but it's not a comment either. <laughs> it's not like opining. I just it was like okay. a sharing of information that I didn't have time to do on Hotline. Is that okay? Yeah. Just really quick. I um, didn't have time to share this, but I just met with a group of elder orphans who are defined by anyone 55 and older who have no spouse, no children, no parents, no siblings, so no one to care for them. And totally unrelated to this idea, th this meeting was, and they said we have, they have like documents already, a group, it's actually all women who have all come together they want to create a tiny home village in Boulder that they would live in, um, and have two of the houses would be for free for a caretaker, and they've got it, all the people signed up, all the plans, HOA fee, I mean, everything dialed in. They would, upon death, leave their home to, like, it would be free, it would be, go back to the city, so it rolls over. And um, she said, you know, the leader of this group said, is there any, possibility for us to do this. This is, we, we're all so low income. And she said, look at, you know, um, Wild Sage is the only co-housing for seniors in our community. And the, the home prices are 650 to 899. And there's a few affordable ones, but they're really few and far between. So I just thought, keep that in your minds as you're listening to this. Um, there's, there's a group already formed and so excited in their elder orphans. It's fascinating. It is uh, Silver Sage that is the senior co yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we also looked at um, uh, modular housing, and th this th this is a very broad category. You can build apartment buildings with modular housing. You can build mobile home communities with modular housing. Um, one of the, um, the interesting approaches to this is you can actually create, you know, net zero type um, housing units um, with this approach, um, uh, but because it's such a wide variety, it's it's it was hard for us to sort of construct an image of what this would look like um, on this site, um, and um, it's it's sort of a housing approach that that could actually support any of the options that we're looking at. So um, we also looked at mobile homes and. Uh, City Council has a long history of supporting the concept of mobile homes. Um, one of the challenges we face, though, there's there's different components of a mobile home community. There's the land, the infrastructure, and the housing. And um, if we don't control the land, um, we also don't control the infrastructure. We don't control the, the costs um, of renting um, within a mobile home community. Uh, at Mapleton, you know, the city came in and purchased that. Um, 
we're working in partnership with Thistle on that property. Um, but it's very difficult to secure it as permanently affordable housing. It's also difficult to have influence on the quality of the housing. Um, so this would be a, a unique opportunity to create a, a mobile home community from the beginning and get a lot of those ingredients right. Um, there's different um, ownership types. Um, uh, we mentioned cooperatives, condominiums, and, and nonprofit um, ownership. The land really becomes the uh, approach that you use for um, controlling the, um, the, the, the permanent um, affordability aspect um, of the project. Um, I would also add that a mobile home community could be um, um, integrated with a, a tiny home community on the same site. Um, I think having doing 17 acres of tiny homes would probably be too much for this site. Um, it would be a lot of units, um, but mixing it with other housing types um, could be, um, you know, could be uh, the, the right scale. Kurt, what, what would be maybe a typical unit per acre for a tiny home development? Um, I think in the range of 20 to 30 at least. Um, per acre? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but okay. And what about for mobile home? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, but um, this says ten. Yeah, yeah. Usually ten. Ten. Is, is yep, doing. that that would make sense. Um, the the other thing that I'll add about about mobile homes is if you're going if you're going to um, invest and go down the road of creating a new community, there needs to be s um, some scale to it. If you're doing you know twenty mobile homes, it just doesn't make sense, and the infrastructure costs become. Uh, quite high. Um, we looked nationally what the trends were for the smallest um, um, parks, and we, we um, actually um, reached out to Rock USA. Um, you know, they, they think that anywhere between five and 10 acres is sort of the, the starting point for the, the size of a mobile home park that would make financial sense. Um, so the other. Um, yeah, so that's what I've, I've just mentioned here. The other thing that I would add about all of these housing options, um, they would all require um, uh, storm sewers um, because it's a, it is a development. So you're um, increasing the ability to um, control storm water. The other, the, the other common theme that you will have seen here is that we're looking for something on, as a light touch on the land. So mobile homes don't have to be on fixed foundations. Uh, tiny homes don't either. But even if they are on fixed foundations, it's a light touch to the land. Um, foundations are typically a response to what, what's sitting on top of them. So the bigger the structure, the bigger the foundation, and the deeper the foundation. Um, so typically, these housing types um, have a very light touch um, on the land and the impacts of um, groundwater and that sort of thing as well. Can I ask you? Yeah. Have you th so? Um, I know in the previous proposal that was before us, that didn't ever come before us. Finally, um, they had um, houses with no basements, trying to do this lighter touch, but they also had quite dense, or it wasn't. I think it was LR, but I guess my question is, have you thought about roads and the infrastructure and how that would affect a light touch? Um, yeah, so, it, and again, it depends on how much of the site you do develop. Um, obviously, roads would be required for um, each of these um, developments, um, but because the, um, the number of units would be substantially less than what was there before. Um, the amount of roads would be, um, would certainly be less than the, the previous developments that were put forward. And I, I don't know, well, we'll continue this discussion. I have an idea. Um, and then this site, it sits actually below the neighborhood around it, right? So when we're talking about groundwater flow, like it rarely flows upward. I'm, I'm not aware of water flowing upward. Okay. Um, okay. 
And then Aaron, Aaron had one more quick question. Geysers. So, all right, water mostly doesn't flow upward. Very good. Um, so you, you mentioned the, uh, the storm sewers that it yep. support housing development. I'd, I'll look at, at Jeff here. If, if you were putting some of these uses on the eastern portion, still west of 55th, but the eastern portion of the site, would the, there be the ability to route that water into the creek? Where, where would storm sewers go from here, do you think? They would have to eventually get to a creek, and we haven't gone to that level of design, but yeah, they, they ultimately have to discharge somewhere. Um, Sure, but I mean, I, the topography, I mean. Yeah, it would, so the the terrain generally in the city slopes northeast, right? So Boulder Creek and South Boulder Creek converge and run into the South Platte. So everything sort of tips that way. So um, presumably you, you would try to get, if you were toward the east side of the site, you would try to get that to South Boulder Creek. If you were along um, the western portion, you might be able to go north or, or north. Okay, we um, have to figure it out. Less into an okay. existing system, but we haven't looked at that. Okay. So the, the, the last option that we'll look at, and um, the, the reason we put this in as a light touch is because um, you could do something like this on just a couple acres of land. Um, so again, this could actually um, interface with or, or um, integrate with other housing types. So the example we gave was the, the Highmar uh, senior housing, which is just up the road from here. Um, it's it's 40 some uh, units, uh, just over two acres. Um, and this could be, um, the reason we looked at senior housing uh, here is because there's senior services at the East Boulder Rec Center, there's trails, it's close to public transport, um, and it's a high need in the community and a growing need in the community. Um, so we thought we would um, put this forward as an option in combination with other um, housing approaches as well. So those are the, the, the four options, if you have any other further questions. We've been asking as we go. So roads were mentioned and storm sewers and other infrastructure needs and what their displacement on the water table maybe so presumably there would also be water and sewer um, typically when you can construct utilities in areas with high groundwater um, the challenge becomes that when you dig those trenches it creates a path for the water to follow so you actually end up with more a challenge of how does it dewater so if you put a sewer line in and you you dig up soil that's been there for a long, long time, It's you're probably not gonna get it compacted back to the level it was before. So the water table would often tend to follow that and be reduced and follow the sewer line until it eventually finds its way back to the creek or finds another path of least resistance. So they would work to dewater the area? That, that is those... typically our experience is that when you install the utilities, it, um, the, the biggest concern we run into, and it often happens with annexations in, in some of the more rural areas of towns, is people worry that their well is going to dry up. Um, Interesting. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the existing flood zones on the site and potential utility uses. I want to clarify up front. Um, that what we'll be discussing is based on the existing conditions on the site and does not reflect the direction we received a few weeks ago related to upstream mitigation. So at the tail end, I'll talk a little bit about how we might unpack that, but just for clarification, this is existing conditions. Um, so this map shows the regulatory 100-year floodplains on the site. Um, the dark blue is the 100-year floodplain, which is a 1% chance of happening in any given year. And you can see on this site, it is um, the far left on the western side, there is an area of 100-year floodplain. And then on the far east side, there is also an area of 100-year floodplain. Um, so development in the 100-year floodplain um, for s residential, it requires that the lowest finished floor be elevated two feet above the base flood elevation. 
Um, for non-residential, it's the same elevation, but there's also an option to build things to be flood resistant, so it's either elevated or it has to be flood proofed. Um, the city also regulates two additional zones within the 100-year floodplain. Um, one of those is the high hazard zone, and the simplest way to explain that is they took a bunch of people up to a flume in Fort Collins and basically experimentally saw what it would take to knock people over. Um, and so that basically is a combination of depth and velocity that would sweep people away. And on this site, it's limited to basically the alignment of Dry Creek Ditch, which is along the western edge. Um, the other zone that we consider is what's called the conveyance zone or the floodway. And that is basically, if you can imagine that you took the floodplain and you just started squeezing it in from either side, and basically by adding fill or structures and whatever it would take to cause that water level to rise six inches, that would be where you would draw those lines. And so basically areas that are in the conveyance zone is where there is a greater um, standard around development because it has potential to cause impacts to other properties. Um, the conveyance zone on this site is limited to a small portion of the blue area on the far eastern side, east of 55th. So the other areas you, under our current regulations, you could add fill, you could add structures, and you would not have to provide offsetting flood capacity based on the existing mapping. Um, the other thing that's shown on here is the 500-year floodplain, um, and those are areas that have a 0.2% chance of being flooded in any given year. Um, the city has a critical facilities ordinance. That's the only regulation we have in the 500 year, and basically that requires certain uses. If we were gonna consider a school or a fire station, um, we would look to have the lowest finished floor of that or um, elevated one feet above the five, one foot above the 500 year elevation. And um, Jeff, that would affect the critical facilities ordinance would apply to senior housing? Um, I think it would depend on the specifics. If it was assisted living, probably. If it was just age-restricted, not necessarily. It would, we'd have to look at whether people were ambulatory. Um, so a consideration, but I think the line is drawn. Like congregate care. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, with any of these scenarios we've talked about, um, they would need to meet the existing floodplain regulations. Um, so the next slide, Dan, please. So this is zoomed out a little farther and provides some context about where this property sits relative to the South Boulder Creek floodplain. So the main stem of South Boulder Creek is to the east of it, and then the site is also impacted by the West Valley overflow that we've recently talked a lot about on the other side. Um, so the South Boulder Creek um, mitigation study that was adopted in 2015 looked at d two potential opportunities in this area. So one is that um, blue arrow that's going north to south, and that was identified as improvements to Dry Creek Ditch Number 2. The other thing that was considered was a detention facility, um, and that study recommended that facility be in the general area of uh, Manhattan Middle School. Um, and then the, the red dots to the north of that are the structures that um, were expected to be removed based on that mitigation. So just to clarify, that, that location is based on protecting structures downstream and not the, the structures upstream and adjacent to this property. So, um, Jeff, I know you said you were going to talk at the end about the, uh, the, what, what were the flood mitigation we're proposing, but when this was originally done, um, was it assuming that the West Valley overflow was mitigated to the 100-year level? Yeah, so so when the, the mitigation study was done, at that point we were looking at option D and 100-year flood mitigation. And so we have not gone back and revisited that at this point because we don't actually have enough data about the option we're pursuing. It, um, so, so to maybe cut to the, the tail end of this, one thing we might want to consider is we are anticipating that the consultants working on phase one will have an analysis to bring that concept up to the standard of the other options you've looked at, hopefully in December, 
and we could take that analysis, give it to another consultant, and have them go revisit the, the mitigation study and figure out how that may impact phase two. Um, and it could cut a couple of different ways. It might, it might make phase two unnecessary. It might change the amount of this site that, that would be logical for detention facilities. Um, so what we have from the 2015 study and what's described in the memo is we had pretty good confidence that we have an interest in doing something along Dry Creek Ditch Number 2. Regardless of how the rest of this plays out, that's a, a flow path and could use some investment. Um, and we've proposed a 100-year, 100-foot um, easement through that corridor. Um, the 2015 study didn't recommend doing detention on the hogan Pancost site, but it also was under a different set of circumstances than we may have following mitigation. So I have a question about middle school, and it was the same one that I asked Jeff, and I'm familiar with the um, synthetic turfs because I live right next to one, and it's a mess when it rains. And I, and the running field with it is a mess too. And there's some real concerns about flooding on that. Um, and so I'm curious in this particular situation with um, Manhattan Middle School, that study was done before the fields were put in. Those fields were just put in last year. It was. And so I think it would behoove us to look at what the, I mean, they're big fields, and I think it would behoove us to look at the implementation or construction of these synthetic fields, and if we still would consider that as where our preferred detention site. So the other end of that dilemma is, is that this project is not in the six-year CIP. Mm -hmm. I couldn't necessarily say that it will make the cut for the 20-year CIP. We've got probably 100 years worth of projects and about $170 million worth of stuff in the queue. So the concern, and so what would happen is if at some point in the future we had funding in the CIP, we would go through a seat process, we would look at conditions at that time and we'll look at a range of options. Um, so what's tricky is it's difficult to say what will even be on that site or in the area by the time we may have funding to proceed with this. Right, um, but we're, I mean, I guess I would kind of throw that out. And the fact is right now we're talking about you know, building a $40 million dam yep. at CU, and um, that we're talking about phase one, phase two, phase three, and it seems logical to me to put phase two in with this phase one at this point in time, and to, to at least consider it, and whether, um, and that's what I would like to know, is if it could be considered, and if, if it turns out that it might be the preferred detention place, we might want to change some funding priorities. And, and that, that's exactly the thought, is that particularly given if, if with the 500-year mitigation to the higher standard, um, the concept that we landed on involves some arrangements with Veeley Channel and Dry Creek Ditch Number 2, we feel like it would be worth at least looking at, yep. before we go do that, should we look at some of these phase two elements? Um, it seems reasonable to also look at how much water will be there and does that change where the recommended location may be? So one of the considerations with the preference for the Manhattan site versus the Hogan Pancast area was it was arguably better aligned with the flow paths under current conditions, but with the upstream detention that may not be the case and Hogan Pancast might be more suitable in that scenario or we may need less detention or not need detention in that corridor. Um, we just, given that it's new information and the engineer hasn't really even turned the crank on right, phase right. one, we haven't been able to, to get someone to take a fresh look at phase two. So from a process standpoint then, if we said, well, heck, I mean, 
public safety first. Um, and we said, okay, yeah, look into this. Does that just hold things up for a year and a half? So again, our th thought would be we should at least be able to take a, a, a quick look and see what the options might be. Um, so we were thinking potentially if we get stuff from the phase one consultant in December, hopefully by the end of first quarter, we'd be able to have some sort of high level report okay, sorry, back. You already said that. Um, we would probably send it back to CH2M Hill that did the 2015 study because they could hit the ground running. They already have the, the modeling set up. They would take the new information from RJH and see if it changes their previous recommendations and would at least be able to give you some idea high level. Um, the, I mean, the other thing that may come out of this is some of these flood risks that are identified on the site with 500 year mitigation may also be reduced. Um, we and we don't questions. know for sure. Mary and then Aaron. So I think that considering that um, makes a lot of sense. That map that you sent today, thank you, that overlays the, the, the jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional wetlands on the 2013 flood extents kind of shows that at least in the 2013 flood, there was flooding, looks like, from Dry Creek Ditch number two onto Hogan Pancost. So it seems to me that that's worth looking at. Um, that may also, I, I, I do think that that is worth exploring. Um, the time and again, you know, na the, the neighborhoods came both while I was on planning board and um, in on council talking about all the times that that area has flooded. So I think it would be um, responsible and responsive to check out that area for flood detention. At the, you know, for, for them, we're spending $40 million um, to, to address flooding over in the West Valley. I think it would be it would be more holistic. Oh, sorry, I'm right. getting into comments. Well, sorry, we're going to have to go there real quick. Did you have another question? Well, so do you have more? I mean, is that it, or is there another? So you actually, I think, caught most of what I had left. The only thing I was going to add, and we actually covered a little bit earlier, was um, Dry Creek Ditch Number Two. We picked up some shares in that through the purchase um, from a utilities perspective. A, a potential use for those. Um, might be to go through water court and change those to be able to use for in-stream flows in South Boulder Creek. Um, South Boulder Creek gets super dry in the summer, um, you know, and, and we've, we have an in-stream flow program on Boulder Creek. Basically, you end up decreeing the, the rights over to the state because they're the only ones that are allowed to manage that and you have a kind of a contractual arrangement where you could get them back for their purposes, but if it ended up that we were going to use the site for something that would have use for, for ditch water on site. That would be a reasonable option as well. Um, so I th think with that you've. Can I, can I just use that? I have one more question. Just comment. Okay. Um, that may be a great idea, but I'm just wondering: is it since we're talking about the same ditch and it's the same ditch owners at, yep. uh, at CU and this property? Could okay. um, could we also use the ditch rights we got on Hogan Pan Pancost for water at Sieve South? Potentially, there's still a water court process. So a right has got a point of diversion and a quantity and a use. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have to we'd have to evaluate whether we could get things changed to move them okay. around. Um, I think it so. could be looked at. I need to throw that out there. Okay, so now we get a give opinions. Are you, oh, you know what? We're this is the most exciting part. Carl is, is the best. Uh, no, it's not. It really isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Geiler with planning. Um, now that the council has heard all the potential land use options on the site, I'm going to touch upon what the regulatory paths forward look like just so the council has a sense of what would need to happen to make uh, these uses uh, happen on the site. So just as a reminder, um, in the Boulder Valley Conference of Plan, we have the three area designations. So planning area one is basically urbanized areas within the city limits of the city. Uh, area two are areas that are eligible for annexation. And then area three are those areas that we call rural uh, preservation areas. 
So looking at the first option, this is what we're calling kind of the land banking option. This is where the council could leave the property in its current use um, for the next couple years or so. Uh, it would remain in agricultural use. Uh, and our, it would have it would be still be subject to Boulder County land use regulations. So there would be potential if the city wanted to to allow uh, the development of two single family homes under the county zoning. Um, so again, this would be no change from the current condition. It would still be eligible for annexation, uh, and it would be city council's decision. The option number two that we have up there is if we were moving towards developing the site with permanently affordable housing, the recreational uses uh, that were discussed, as well as the utility purposes, uh, some of which that Jeff uh, talked about. So this would require annexation of the property. Um, this would go through a process similar to what we've seen on the site before, except that the city would be the applicant. Um, there would be an annexation agreement drafted up as part of the whole process and engagement with the neighborhoods. Uh, this could be done at any time. Um, so that's um, that would ultimately result in the site being planning area one. Uh, another option would be to explore or move towards the open space uses, um, some of which that Dan talked about. This would make it more like the open space areas around the city. So this would be what we call a service area contraction that would ultimately result in it being planning area three. Um, this is a, a slightly different process in that it would have to be done during a midterm update. So our next update is coming up in 2020 and it would be a four body review. So it would have to go through um, the city planning board, city council, as well as the county board of commissioners and the county planning commission. So another option and option number four is if the council wanted to move towards uh, designating the site the planning a planning reserve. So the council is aware that there's a there's an area east of US 36 that we have as as the planning reserve. This is an area that's like a rural preservation area, but it's designated for a possible location in the future for future uses that the city finds to be compelling enough and a priority enough that, that the use cannot be met within the service area of the city. So this is basically a pretty high bar um, if the council wanted to call this site the planning reserve. Um, this is something that would have to meet certain criteria uh, and there would have to be a lot of evaluation and depending on the use. So this again would leave the site open for potential future housing, um, recreational or utility purposes. And the other thing to consider for putting it in the planning reserve is that this can only be done during a major update. So if the council wanted to move towards this, we would recommend that it be changed to planning area three at the next update, and then it would be moved to planning reserve in 2025 as part of a major update. So the last consideration is at the bottom of the matrix is that depending on whatever land use the, the council chooses there, we would expect that there would have to be a land use map change um, designating the, the chosen land uses on the site. So that could result in public land use, open space land use, or potentially residential land use. So it's kind of a high level review of the potential options and you can answer some questions on that. And there, but there's no rush to do any of this until we wanted to do something. Yeah, I think we'd want to know specifically. I mean, it could be a combination of these options. We'd want to know exactly what the council wanted to move towards and then we would um, start those processes. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, Aaron has a process suggestion. Well, just in terms of next steps, and Jeff, what you could presented about the uh, updating the, the flood study based on our new flood mitigation option that we've chosen and then uh, looking at the implications for phase two, to me it seems like is the critical next step before we think about what to do here. Because if this turns out to be a really workable place for phase two flood detention, then to me that's clear highest and best use of the land. And if it simply doesn't work to put flood detention here, well then that's really important to know to think about what else we might do here instead, uh, or what the flow levels would be to say how much flood detention would you need. So to my mind it seems like that we really need that information before taking a, a real next step. So to see what council thinks about that. Well, the, I totally agree with Aaron, and, and that would be the only option I would consider at this point in time, and, and let Jeff get that consultant to do that study. 
and get the results, and then we would have another conversation about what do we do. So let's. I'm just kind of curious. Gut check from staff. I, I, would that feel like a massive punt of the ball or a really smart move? <laughs> They're all going to be mad at me because they'll have to come back again. Um, from a utilities perspective, it's something we needed to do anyway. It's just it, it's we're moving up the timing, and, and we discussed today, and we feel like it's we can pull off a scope in that time frame. Well, it just so much affects what other uses we might yeah. put there too. And just I just might add that. Um, the amenity maintenance might go hand in hand with until we have an answer because there is a, a big weed problem that needs to be dealt with and mowing at least the very minimal for aesthetic improvements and ecological improvements would go hand in hand with waiting for results too. Um, Mary, and also there's that three acres. Okay, Mary and then Cindy. Yeah, that's what I was gonna bring up, the three acres. Um, so that seems like that is sort of separate from the rest of the parcel. So it seems to me that if that could move into open space or maybe explore the Joe Kent thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mary, that's what I was going to suggest. Um, I basically agree with Lisa and Aaron and you. And um, I'd like to see it explored before we talk about moving it into open space, we can put conditions on it. And Bob even had an asking price. So. Um, that we would really ex <laughs> <laughs> that we would explore that very carefully so that we at least it winnows it down to a smaller part and since all four of these groups i know are just dying to have this property um they're gonna have to do some yeah some real dickering over it well so let's just clarify that those three acres um explore both options open space and mr kent and then come back to us is that what we're saying um tip Typically, if it was a conservation easement, that probably, I'll look to Jane, but probably would be overseen by open space mountain parks. We would probably hold the conservation easement. When it was being considered for development, those three acres were on the table for that as well, and we were exploring both the conservation easement concept or an ownership. And um, so we were, at that time, exploring the conservation easement concept even three years ago. So. Great, well, so it sounds like something that might already be teed up. Okay, does anybody disagree with exploring those those two options for the three acres east of 55th? Okay, and then about getting the answer back on the flood study before we decide additional uses? Okay, going, going, gone. Jeff, the ball's in your court. <laughs> I have one other thing I'd like to okay. say, which the is that is. I really like Kurt's presentation on the small, tiny houses, village concept and there were regulatory issues in there they're not existent so the city I take it doesn't allow those kinds of things at this point in time or did you mean with that specific no it property? means tiny homes are not allowed or yeah I mean in the in the land use code right now the tiny homes aren't necessarily defined we don't have any specific regulations for them I think the way the zoning code would look at it at this point as like a single family house. I think there might be some building code issues that I'm not necessarily familiar with that we, we would have to look at further. Um, but the other consideration to take into account is, um, you know, as an annexation, we would be able to address some of those no, concerns. I wasn't thinking about it at this on this particular place because it doesn't make sense to me that we would build anything that would affect the water table given that one of the reasons the city bought Hogan Pancos was to allay the, the concerns of the neighbors. Um, so you point in that bringing particular it up. thing. But I was just bringing it up because even if it's not there, I would like to see us go ahead and formulate some kinds Planning of- Planning retreat question. Okay. Because we have a long okay. list on their housing. Okay. Hey, the well, only other thing I just was, and this is just a really quick one. There was nothing mentioned in here about putting up solar or you know, using, and I'm just curious, is that because it wasn't thought of, or just, no, we don't need it here? But anyhow, yeah, that's the only thing that I was surprised not to see. So we, we did big, think of it. Okay. I'm pretty sure we were thinking about it early on, and I think we were worried about the prairie dogs. Really? My recollection, vague recollection, was that there, we might also have enough solar at East Boulder Rec to 
meet the load oh, there okay. and we would have the yeah. issue of that would not be having 120%. having not having something on site to yeah. oh so after we to, I don't know and any. I could be right wrong on that but I think that yeah. came up bring it back all right excellent all right good enough for tonight mm -hmm. all right thank you Acts and go home. Indonesia's government reluctantly accepted international aid last week, but on Monday night it issued a statement restricting foreign NGO activity. The new rules forbid foreign citizens working for NGOs to conduct activities on affected sites and advise those already deployed 